Section 17 of The Outline of Science, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Madeline Hertz. The Outline of Science, Volume 4, by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 35, Ethnology. There are sound reasons for regarding the existing races of mankind as varieties of one species, Homo sapiens, just as the numerous breeds of pigeons are offshoots from the ancestral stock of the rock dove. One reason is that, so far as is known, the members of the different races are fertile with one another, giving rise to fertile crosses, such as mulattoes. Another reason is that the embarrassingly numerous races grade into one another. And a third reason may be found in the extreme improbability that such a happy new departure as the modern man type, Homo sapiens, would arise more than once in evolution. It is likely that some tentative types, like Neanderthal man, antecedent to the modern man type, became extinct or were absorbed, it is likely that Homo sapiens arose from a stock which he shared with the Neanderthal, the Heidelberg, and the Pithecanthropus races. One species with many races. The number of different races of man is very large, but the phenomenon is familiar at lower levels. A group of living creatures belonging to a species becomes in some way isolated. Variations or mutations may occur in the families, and they are often numerous. Selection or sifting sets in and the variants, which are fittest in relation to the particular conditions of life, become dominant over their neighbors. Inbreeding occurs, and the new characters become firmly established, while analogous recessive characters with a disadvantageous bias are sifted out. A race is established. Thus, if the original color of man was brown, a dark-colored race or a white race may have arisen over and over again in different parts of the earth. It must be understood also that a removal of isolation barriers, example by a migration or an invasion, would tend to bring about a mingling of races, and as a result, new permutations and combinations. Inbreeding promotes stability and uniformity. Outbreeding promotes variability unless the divergence of the parents is too pronounced. One is apt to underestimate the possibilities of novelties. Professor E. G. Conklin writes, The principles of Mendelian inheritance show that for every pair of contrasting characters in the two parents, as for example, straight or curly hair, brown or blue eyes, there are two types of grandchildren showing these characters. When there are five such pairs of contrasting characters in the parents, there may be two to the fifth, or thirty-two types of grandchildren, showing various combinations of these five characters. When there are ten pairs of contrasting characters, there may be two to the tenth, or one thousand twenty-four types of grandchildren. Between different races, there are many more than ten unit differences, and thus, with a relatively small number of mutant characters, an enormous number of different combinations of the characters is possible in the offspring. Subsequent inbreeding of such a mixed race leads to the separation or segregation of particular types having certain of these combinations from other types having other combinations. As with domestic animals and cultivated plants, so with human races. Mutations or variations arise, as to the conditions determining the origin of the distinctly new, there is little certainty. There is sifting by selection and stabilizing by inbreeding. There is mingling with fresh blood and a fresh shuffling of the hereditary cards. There emerges a new set of novelties. There is sifting and inbreeding again. In outline, that is how race forming has come about. 1. The Primary Groups of Mankind More for convenience than with conviction, ethnologists are accustomed to recognize three primary groups of human races, the black, the yellow, and the white. Each group has numerous subdivisions or races, 
Each race may have its subrace, each subrace its breeds, each breed its stocks. 1. The group of black or negroid races is typically characterized by darkly pigmented skin, frizzly hair, a broad, flat nose, thick lips, prominent eyes, large teeth, a narrow hip girdle, and long heads, dolichocephaly. But there is great variety within the group which includes African Negroes, South African Bushmen, various pygmy races, together with such divergent types as the Melanesians and the Australian Blackfellows, who have not frizzly hair. 2. The group of yellow or Mongolian races is typically characterized by yellowish skin, black, straight hair, broad face with prominent cheekbones, small nose, sunken narrow eyes, moderately sized teeth, and diverse types of skull. Here come in Chinese, Japanese, Tibetans, Siamese, Burmese, Malays, Brown Polynesians, Maoris, the Eskimo, and Red Indians, and most divergent of all, the Laps and Finns, the Magyars and Turks. 3. The group of white or Caucasian races is typically characterized by soft and straight hair, well-developed beard, retreating cheekbones, narrow and prominent nose, small teeth, and broad hip girdle. But the group includes, along with the fair-haired and white-skinned people of Northern Europe, the dark-haired and often dark-complexioned Southerners. Thus in Europe we may distinguish the tall and blonde Nordics, the stocky dark Alpines, and the small dark Mediterraneans, while in Asia there are the Indo-Aryan and other types. It hardly requires to be said, for the heterogeneity of our enumeration is so evident that these three primary groups, Negroid, Mongolian, and Caucasian, do not mean very much scientifically. Yet, everyone will admit that a Persian is nearer to a Britisher than a Hottentot is, and we think we understand what an Arab is after, while a Chinaman remains a Sphinx. A Change of Outlook a generation ago, it was thought possible to distinguish three primary races, a phrase we have not used, black, yellow, and white, and it was commonly thought that these represented a very ancient trifurcation of the human species. But there are good reasons for suspecting that this view, which we might call the Shem, Ham, and Japheth view, is all too simple. No doubt the contrasts are striking and real. We are all familiar, Sir Arthur Keith writes, with the features of that racial human type which clusters round the heart of Africa. We recognize the Negro at a glance by his black, shining, hairless skin, his crisp hair, his flattened nose, his widely opened dark eyes, his heavily molded lips, his gleaming teeth and strong jaws. He has a carriage and proportion of body of his own. He has his peculiar quality of voice and action of brain. He is, even to the unpractised eye, clearly different from the Mongolian native of northeastern Asia. The skin, the hair, the eyes, the quality of brain and voice, the carriage of the body and proportion of limb to body serve to pick out the Mongol as a sharply differentiated human type. Different from either of them is the native of Central Europe the Aryan or Caucasian type of man. We know him by the paleness of his skin and by his facial features, particularly his narrow, prominent nose and thin lips. We are so accustomed to the prominence of the Caucasian nose that only a Mongol or Negro can appreciate its singularity in our Aryanized world. Now, if the distinctive features are so well marked as this great authority indicates, why should we hesitate to accept them as indicative of a fundamental trifurcation of the human species? The answer is interesting. 2. Hormones and Ethnology At many points in this outline of science, reference has been made to the ductless glands of internal secretion which manufacture hormones and chelones, potent chemical messengers discharged into the blood. The pituitary body, about the size of a ripe cherry, attached to the base of the brain and cradled in the floor of the skull, makes a secretion that regulates growth. An abnormal enlargement brings about acromegaly, 
which profoundly alters the character of face and body, hands and feet, or the youth may become an unhealthy giant, or the limbs may grow disproportionately long, and the sex system fail to develop properly, the result being sometimes unicoid obesity. We are justified, Sir Arthur Keith says, in regarding the pituitary gland as one of the principal pinions in the machinery which regulates the growth of the human body and is directly concerned in determining stature, cast of features, texture of skin, and character of hair. All of them marks of race. When we compare the chief racial types of humanity, Negro, the Mongol, and the Caucasian or European, we can recognize in the last named a greater predominance of the pituitary than in the other two. The sharp and pronounced nasalization of the face, the tendency to strong eyebrow ridges, the prominent chin, the tendency to bulk of body and height of stature in the majority of Europeans are best explained, so far as the present state of our knowledge goes, in terms of pituitary function. Before this view can be accepted in its entirety, there must be very precise comparisons of the pituitary body in different races, for science begins with measurement. But the idea is plainly a shrewd one. It does not mean that the European is an acromegalic in disguise. It means that variations in the development of the ductless glands may account for some of the changes that are rung on human characters. There is some evidence that some of the extinct giant vertebrates had relatively large pituitary bodies. Variations in the development and activity of these regulating organs may have played an important part, not only in the evolution of human races, but in the evolution of vertebrate types. We must not follow this fascinating line of thought much further, but it may be noted that the hormones from the reproductive organs have a profound influence on many characters of the body, that the suprarenal secretions affect pigmentation and hair, that the thyroid glands set astride in the windpipe just behind Adam's apple influence skin and hair, skull and skeleton, that two kinds of dwarfs are due to a defect in their growth regulating function, that the abnormal children, significantly called Mongolian idiots, are not reversions to hypothetical Mongolians supposed to have once lived in Europe, but are the outcome of disordered thyroid functioning. Given a susceptible structure, variations in the internal secretions may account for many features which have been overexalted as deep racial differences. On the other hand, we must not minimize these racial differences because Sir Arthur Keith gives us a clue which makes them more intelligible. The difference between male and female is a very profound one, and nonetheless far-reaching because it may turn out to be fundamentally a difference in the rate and rhythm of metabolism, or because the actualization of some of the secondary sex characters depends on the liberating stimulus supplied at appropriate times by hormones from the reproductive organs. It is a luminous idea, however, that racial differences in skull and skin, and hair and color, may be correlated with hereditary variations in the ductless glands, and we see the likelihood that the same types, example pygmies, may have arisen repeatedly on different lines of evolution, and in widely separated parts of the world. Modern science has transformed the old Ham, Shem, and Japheth doctrine. 3. The Making of Races Ethnology studies races rather than nationalities, and by a race is meant a subspecies or a variety, a group of individuals with many features in common, and with a community of ancestry within itself greater than that between it and another race. But the difficulty is to find pure races in modern times after so many centuries of intermingling. A race may consist of clans, and a clan of tribes, and a tribe of communities, and a community of families, all these words implying different degrees of kinship. But the idea of kinship is not necessarily implied in the word nation or nationality, which is a political conception. 
a social integrate with a geographical home, and some measure of psychical unity. A unified nationality may include several distinct races, but in some cases, such as the Swedes, race and nation are almost convertible terms. It is plain, however, that kinship groupings with which ethnology deals must be distinguished from political and social groupings. The making of numerous races depends, first of all, on man's migratory tendencies, and the question rises why mankind has spread over all the earth. Even in prehistoric times, man has gone practically everywhere. There were Moriori's in New Zealand before the Maoris, the American Indians were preceded by the Mound Builders, there has always been someone before Columbus, and the question is why man is the most wide-ranging of all mammals. The answer must be found in his big brain. Always restless, ever adventurous, able to adapt life to circumstances and to force nature into service. But we must look for spurs to adventure in the ever-recurrent pressure of increased population and in the frequent changes of climatic and other environmental conditions. Man is not a very prolific organism, but parental care is strong and effective, and a little one soon becomes a thousand, and a small band a great nation. The pressure of increasing population may be checked by infanticide, or by a very high death rate. Perhaps the keener spur was an environmental change, such as the setting in of aridity, which made trekking imperative. As Ellsworth Huntington and others have shown, climatic changes and diversities have had a profound effect on human evolution. They prompt migration, they insist on initiative, they sift and winnow, and perhaps they stimulate variability. The old view that in a new climate men acquired new modifications, which were entailed as racial characters, is not readily tenable. In the new country, new germinal variations crop up, and there is an elimination of the relatively less fit variants. It is indirect rather than direct adaptation that we see in the establishment of races. Wandering is prompted by the adventurous spirit, by pressure of increasing population, and by climatic changes. Adaptive varieties arise. But we cannot leave out of account the conflict of races, which has gone on through the ages almost without ceasing. Diffusion and spreading may mean at first nothing more than man versus nature, but sooner or later they involve man versus man. Over and over again, a superior race has ousted an inferior. Over and over again, the victory in the long run has been with the conquered. It would be preposterous within brief limits to try to estimate the relative importance of the various forms of the human struggle for existence, but it is idle to deny that the conflict of races has been one of the sieves of mankind. Diffusions, migrations, raids, conquests, colonizations bring about intermingling or hybridization. In regard to the profitable limits of this, we know little. The union of races, having markedly different characteristics, is apt to be disappointing. Hence, the popular prejudice against the half-breeds, Drs. East and Jones, have put the case biologically. Through the operation of the laws of heredity, such unions tend to break apart series of character complexes which through years of selection have proved to be compatible with each other, and with the persistence of the race under the environment to which it has been subjected. Because of the transmission of factors in linked groups, the low probability of obtaining a single recombination equal or superior to the average of the latter race does not warrant the production of multitudes of racial mediocrities, which such a mixture entails. But there is another fact, which history seems to verify, that very good results follow the intermingling of peoples who are unlike, but not too unlike. Thus, 
Great Britain is inhabited by a very variable people whose blood includes contributions from many diverse Nordic Aryan stocks. Similarly, the so-called Jewish race is made up of complex crosses. The moral is that in a strong nation, the mingling of good stocks is promiseful. Ethnology and Population There is diversity of fertility in different races, and this has been operated as a factor in evolution. There has always been a yellow peril, or of some other color. As a matter of fact, the yellow races are not at present increasing very rapidly in numbers, for while their fecundity is high, so is their death rate. Similarly, in the United States, the rate of increase of the blacks is not equal to that of the whites, for the death rate among the Negroes is high. It is plain that differential fertility, greater increase in some races than in others, must lead to struggle in many forms, prompting wars, migrations, and colonizations, leading to social unrest and distress, and sometimes profoundly affecting the current moral sentiment. For it is very interesting to observe in contemporary evolution how economic conditions lead naturally to polygamy in one tribe and to polyandry in another, to exposure of female infants in one region and to their welcome in another. But beyond the problem of differential fertility, there is that of the possible overpopulation of the globe. Every year, some 40 million persons die, but far more than that are born. It has been estimated that the human population is at present about 1,700,000,000, about a third of these being white. In most of the older civilized countries, there has been for some years a decline in the birth rate, but there is also a notable lowering of the death rate. As civilization develops, the length of life will be increased and the health rate will be heightened. The world will become too full though prophetic statisticians differ considerably as to the date of the tight fit. The population question, said Huxley, is the real riddle of the Sphinx, to which no political Oedipus has yet found an answer. In view of the ravages of the terrible monster, over multiplication, all other riddles sink into insignificance. There are two suggestions, however, which must be considered. The first is that science is rapidly increasing man's mastery of the resources of nature. In many a field, he can reap a richer harvest every year, and at less cost. The limits of this are unknown. The second suggestion is that increased birth control in its most enlightened forms. Must races decline? There is no one answer to the difficult problem of the decline of races. 1. Sometimes there may have been a hopeless context with a relatively fitter civilization, especially when that included entirely new weapons, appliances, diseases, and luxuries. It is not necessary that the contact of the old and new should involve a malevolent conflict. Even Pacific unconformability may be fatal, as the modern story of some Central African tribes clearly shows. 2. Sometimes, perhaps an aggressive and insurgent sub-race, or, more usually, a nationality, may outstep itself in militarism, may suffer too severely from an elimination of its best men, and may be overwhelmed by hordes of pushing and populous newly integrated peoples, naturally, and not altogether unjustly, called barbarians. Even Julius Caesar complained that there was beginning to be a lack of men. 3. Sometimes, perhaps, the damning factor has been a slackening of morale, an insatiable love of luxury and ease, a slackening of the biological ideal of good stock and happy families, a relapse into the prosaic, the epicurean, and the flabby. For lack of vision, as well as for lack of knowledge, the people perish. 4. Sometimes, we think, the fatal blow has come from the hand of God, a succession of arid seasons, which has happened often, a failure of agricultural and pastoral industry, a dismal turning of fruitful land into desert, 
And then came the desperate trekking, often, if not often set, a tragedy, though sometimes eventually a great success. Or it might be that the hand of God expressed itself in the introduction and the normal course of events of a new terror, such as a new parasite. So, according to some authorities, the introduction of the malaria-disseminating mosquito into Greece brought about the warning of that glory. And everyone knows how modern races allow themselves to be victimized by avoidable parasitic diseases, just as the heathens, more excusably, submit to hookworm and its horrors. Yet it does not seem to be biologically necessary that a race should decline and die out. On the animal genealogical tree, there are many branches that have been dead for millions of years. The fossil-bearing rocks, the great graveyards of the buried past, are full, not only of ancestors, but of lost races. Yet, there are many very ancient races of animals that are going strong today, and there seems no reason why this should not hold true for human races also, provided that the survival value of health and vigor of body and mind is practically recognized. End of section 17. Recording by Madeline Hertz. Section 18 of The Outline of Science, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Catherine E. The Outline of Science, Volume 4, by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 36. The Story of Domesticated Animals, Part 1. The art of domesticating wild animals is one of immense antiquity, carrying us back to a period long before written records were possible. So far as the evidence goes, it would seem that the dog was the first of man's conquests over nature, and this was made towards the end of what we know as the Stone Age or Paleolithic period. Man was still a nomad and a hunter, but he had by this time developed the custom of burying his dead and more than this, he would seem also by this time to have developed some vague notions, at least, of a future life, for when a man died, his rude weapons and his dog were buried with him, as if to serve him in the land of shadows. It is to this custom that we owe our only evidence as to the period when the domestication of animals began. And since the dog only is found with these early interments, we must conclude that it was man's first companion and servant. Puppies brought home perhaps to amuse the children laid the foundation of what was to prove an immense aid to the evolution of civilization. With the succeeding Neolithic stage of culture, wherein the surfaces of the stone axes and other weapons were beautifully polished, the nomadic habit gave place to settlements, and the arts of peace, pottery making, weaving, and agriculture, and the possession of flocks and herds. The wild oxen, sheep, goats, and pigs by which these ancient men were surrounded all seem to have been laid under tribute almost simultaneously to furnish, from animals bred in captivity, a permanent supply of meat, milk, skins, and beasts of burden. Domestication during unnumbered thousands of years have done nothing to change these several animals in one respect, and this in the matter of the peculiarities of their flesh as food. For each still has its characteristic qualities and flavor. An ox, a sheep, and a pig, all reared in the same field and partaking of the same food, will yet, owing to the subtle and inherent differences in their nature, respond differently to their nurture. Yet, in the matter of form, size, and rate of maturity, these creatures, under man's control, have undergone the most striking transformation, so much so that the various races of many of our breeds of domestic animals differ more from one another than do many wild species. Our various breeds of cattle, sheep and pigs, dogs and horses are all witnesses of this fact. These are often cited as so many examples of the breeder's art 
as if the founder of any given breed had before him a definite conception, a power of visualizing the ultimate development of the salient features, at any rate, of the breed he cherished. The breeder of the old English bulldog could have had no conception of the bulldog of today. It would have filled him with consternation, for the bulldog as we know it would have been useless for the work which his ancestors had to perform. All that the breeder has been able to do is so to control the mating of his stock as to accentuate such variations from the normal as seem to him, either from utilitarian or spectacular reasons, to be worth cultivating. In his own day he sees but little real change. Only after some scores or hundreds of generations is there any striking advance on the type accepted by the earlier breeders. 1. Horses Our domesticated horses, there is good reason to believe, are descended not merely from more than one originally wild species, but from two distinct stocks. One of these, which flourished during Pliocene times, was a slender-limbed species, standing about fifteen hands high, and having a broad forehead and tapering face, and certain peculiarities of the molar teeth. This type is represented by the Siwali course, Equus Sivalensis. The Arab may be a descendant of this stock. The other dates from Pleistocene times, and is represented by a smaller, heavier, stout-limbed animal, surviving today in the Tarpan or Mongolian wild horse, Equus Prusevalski. This view is supported by the striking likeness of the prehistoric carvings of horses of Stone Age man, which have been found in the haunts of cavemen in France and elsewhere. During prehistoric times, however, it was apparently represented by more than one species. The survivors today appear to be the Mongolian horse of the Gobi Desert, just referred to, and the Celtic pony, represented by a race of small horses or ponies, ranging from Connemara, the Outer Hebrides, Iceland and the Faroes, to western Norway. While it is generally held that, with the exception of the dog, man possessed no domesticated animals until Neolithic times, and that the horse was the last of his conquests, it must be remembered that engravings of horses' heads wearing a rope-like halter have been found, which were certainly the work of men, of the Paleolithic period. Yet during these times, in favoured localities perhaps, the horse formed one of the staple articles of diet. This much is shown by the refuse heap discovered outside the celebrated cave or rock shelter of Solutre. This could scarcely have accommodated more than half a dozen families, but the entrance was protected by two walls of horse bones, one hundred and fifty feet long and ten feet high, the other forty feet long and five feet high, representing, it is estimated, the remains of some one hundred thousand horses. The man who engraved the horse's head with a bridle, an orientation, also added his share of victims to this pile. That the horse was domesticated in Neolithic times, there is no room for doubt, though whether used as a riding animal or as a beast of burden is not known. It may be that it was first domesticated for the sake of its flesh and milk, then as a beast of burden, pack-horse, and still later as a draught animal. But though during all this time isolated peoples may have used horses for riding purposes, it is significant that the ancient Egyptians and Assyrians, the ancient Greeks and Romans, and the ancient Britons used them to draw chariots, and not as riding animals. British Breeds this is not the place for a detailed description of our British breeds of horses. Suffice it to say that the oldest of these is represented by the Shetland, Welsh, New Forest, Dartmoor, Exmoor, and Connemara ponies. In the south of Scotland, a larger type, known as the Galloway, is found. From the larger types of these ponies, the old pack horses of the south of England were bred, and these were also largely used for riding. The magnificent carriage horse known as the Cleveland Bay hails from the north riding of Yorkshire. Of its early history nothing is known, but it is believed to have been produced by crossing horses of foreign blood 
with the native stock of the district. Nearly akin to this is the Yorkshire coach-horse, an animal of rather more slender build. Unfortunately, both these breeds are threatened with extinction. Among the English heavy breeds, perhaps the most famous is the Shire horse, the great horse of medieval England. According to some, this breed was derived from the chariot horses of the Britons of Caesar's time. The slightly smaller Clydesdale represents a Shire horse in Scotland. It is a comparatively recent breed dating back to the importation in 1715 of a Flemish stallion, which was crossed with native horses. The Suffolk Punch is a famous and very distinct breed, and readily distinguished from either of the foregoing breeds, having a large head, short arched neck, low and heavy shoulders, straight back, and short limbs. It is a very powerful animal, but suitable only for farm work. As to its origin nothing certain is known, but it is believed to have been carried from Normandy centuries ago into the eastern counties of England. THE ARAB As to the Arab, this type, as already mentioned, represents an older stock than that of the cold-blooded western horses, since it is apparently descended from the Indian Pliocene Siwalik horse, and in consequence it has been claimed it should rank as a distinct species. But be this as it may, the part played by this animal in the history of the evolution of domesticated horses is one of profound importance for it has been proved beyond cavil that there is hardly a breed of our western horses which has not been immensely improved by an infusion of Arab blood. During the time of the Crusaders, Arabs, Barbs, and Turks, the two latter being derivatives of the Arab, were from time to time introduced into England, and these importations were continued at intervals and aimlessly up till the time of James I. From this time till Anne's reign, just hundred years, Arabs, Barbs, and Turks were imported in considerable numbers for the set purpose of improving our native racehorses. The sires of the earlier importations were mated with native English mares, and it was the progeny of these unions which laid the foundations of our thoroughbred or racehorse, a peculiarly English creation, though now scattered all over the world. But more than this, Throughout all this time, thoroughbred sires have been persistently used for the purpose of improving the quality of ponies, carriage horses, and riding horses, as well as of the heavier breeds. It is for the preservation of this refining stock that we need our race courses today. The domestic ass is a direct descendant of the North African wild ass, Equus asinus africanus from which it differs but little in appearance and coloration, though some breeds are black and some white. The largest of all domesticated asses is that of Poitou, some specimens of which rival cart horses in point of size. In Spain, as in the East, ass breeding is carefully studied, and this has resulted in the development of a number of distinct types, finer in appearance and of greater utility than any found in England where it is never used for riding purposes, save for children, or in farm work. But with us, and indeed wherever it is met with, its milk is valued. In ancient times in the East, herds of she-asses were kept solely for the sake of their milk. The mule is, properly, the product of the cross between the male ass and the mare. The product of the converse cross between the stallion and the she-ass is known as a hinny. In the British islands mules are as a rule very little used, but in Spain they are prized on account of their sure-footedness in mountainous country. They are largely employed in the Punjab frontier districts for military purposes, where mule batteries for hill work are needed. During the late war large numbers were also imported into this country to be used on the various fronts for military transport purposes. In addition to their sure-footedness, mules, in proportion to their size, are stronger and more enduring than horses. Like the ass, they will also thrive on poorer fodder, and are less liable to disease, and they are further said to be longer-lived. 
as is commonly the case with hybrids between very distinct species, neither mules nor hinnies are fertile, consequently no new breeds are possible. 2. Cattle It is worth remembering that the earliest known British domestic cattle, which date back to Neolithic times, are of an alien breed, the Celtic Shorthorn, Bos Longifrons. The origin of this breed is unknown, for it has nowhere been found, and its remains are scattered all over Europe, save as a domesticated animal. And it remained the only domesticated ox, as far as the British islands are concerned, until the coming of the English, five hundred years after the birth of Christ. These new settlers, it would seem, either brought with them a new breed, derived from the great wild ox, or aurochs, of Europe, Bos primigenius, or they gathered to themselves herds from the wild aurochs which they found in the vast woods which still covered the country. But be this as it may, it is from this stock that most of our native breeds of today are descended. At one time it was firmly believed that the famous white park cattle, of which the best known are the Chillingham and Chartley herds, were the lineal descendants of the aurochs. Today they are held to be extremely ancient descendants of one of the many domesticated breeds which can be directly traced to this source. The black Pembroke cattle or Welsh runts, the black and red Highland cattle or the Kylos, and the Longhorned are the most famous of the breeds which man has, so to speak, fashioned out of the original stock, the wild aurochs. Careful selection on the part of the old-time breeders has brought about the evolution of three distinct types of our British domesticated cattle, beef-producing, dairy cattle, and draught animals. Of the first-named type, the Shetland would stand easily first but for its small size, since it attains to maturity earlier than any other of our British breeds of cattle, and as beef it is unsurpassed. This breed also furnishes some wonderful milkers, Carry cows are famous, yielding in proportion to their size more milk than any other British breed. But most of our dairy cattle are represented by dairy shorthorns. While the Celtic shorthorn and the aurochs have furnished the stock from which our British breeds of cattle have been derived, on the continent a number of very distinct breeds are found, which have been derived from the Indian humped cattle, which in turn are descended from the wild Malayan Banton, Bos Sondiacus. The large, dun-coloured Podolian and Hungarian cattle with enormous horns, and the similar cattle of northern Spain, are derived from humped cattle, and are used largely for draught purposes and agriculture. The Castilian and Andalusian bulls, and those of the Navarra breed, used in bullfights, are apparently descended from the aurochs. The Indian humped cattle differ from the European cattle in the great fleshy hump on the withers, which may weigh as much as forty or fifty pounds, and is esteemed a great delicacy in India. Furthermore, they display an enormous dewlap, and the voice is a grunt rather than a low. Commonly the humped ox is known as a zebu, a word of unknown origin and never used in India. These animals in India commonly take the place of horses. Some breeds, like the Hisar cattle of the northwest provinces, have enormous horns and drooping ears. The native cattle of Africa are the humped races, though some, like the Uganda cattle and the famous Cape Trek oxen, have lost the hump. In these and the newer cattle of the eastern Sudan, the horns often attain a huge size. Very different from any of the wild oxen so far mentioned is the great Indian buffalo, or Arna, standing six feet at the withers, and with enormous outstanding horns. Domesticated breeds of this animal are used by the natives throughout India, Ceylon, and the Malay states. The Todas of the Nilgiri hills of Madras keep enormous herds of these buffaloes for the sake of their milk and butter. In many parts of the plains they are mainly employed for agricultural operations and as beasts of burden. The last of the wild oxen which have been brought under the yoke of man is the yak of Tibet, the nearest living relative of the bison. 
It is used both as a beast of burden and as a riding animal, while it also furnishes food and clothing to the hardy natives. It has also been introduced into parts of Siberia. Here, as in Tibet, travel without its aid would be an impossibility. 3. Sheep They were great benefactors of mankind who first domesticated the sheep, but we can raise no monument to their memory, for we know no more than that they lived in Neolithic times. And the difficulty of any effort today to identify these benefactors is immensely increased by the fact that the gentle art of shepherding was acquired in two widely sundered regions. This much seems certain, since our existing flocks give proofs of a derivation from two very distinct stocks, the Mufloon of Europe, Ovis Musimon, and the Asiatic Uriel, Ovis Vignae, and he would be a bold man who would venture to say whether the Europeans or the Asiatics were the first flock masters. But man has done more than domesticate the sheep. He has transformed it to a much greater extent than is the case with cattle or the horse. Today we think of sheep in terms of wool. To us it is before all else a woolly animal. But this is not the case in the wild sheep, which appears to be as hairy as an antelope or a goat, but under the superficial hairy coat is an under fur, as in many other animals, like seals, for example. During long ages of domestication, this under fur has been developed so that only the face and legs retain their original covering. Two other changes have resulted from domestication. The brain has greatly decreased in size as compared with wild sheep, and the tail has greatly increased in length, so much so that docking has become imperative in nearly all breeds. But some breeds of domesticated sheep have no wool, such, for example, as the African long-legged sheep and the Abyssinian maned sheep. By way of contrast, we may take an example or two from among the woolly breeds, wherein the wool has been enormously developed, as in the merino and the Scottish black-faced, in which the fleece reaches to the ground. But the wool of the last named is of more use for carpet-making than for cloth-making. It is difficult to imagine today how the civilized world contrived to rub along without wool, but when and where man first conceived the desire to cultivate its growth, we shall probably never know. It began, we may suppose, among people who used skins for clothing, and these would be people living where the winters were severe. This factor, the stimulus of the cold, would of itself induce an increased development of the underfur where, as in the sheep, it already existed. When the primitive herdsman discovered that such skins were warmer than the normal hairy skins, he would speedily set himself to breed only from such of his flocks as promised the wooliest coats. A very remarkable kind of wool is that of the Bukharan or Astrakhan Dumba sheep, the very young lambs of which furnish the much-prized fur known as astrakhan. It is a native of Bokhara and the Kyrgyz steppes, and of Persia. Though most of our British breeds of sheep are now hornless, some, like the Norfolk, Dorset, and Scottish sheep, have really magnificent spiral horns. In the matter of these weapons, indeed, sheep have, under domestication, developed some very remarkable features. For some, like the St. Kilda sheep, have increased the number from one to as many as three pairs, while in the Wallachian sheep they take the form of extremely long spirals, looking like giant corkscrews. The tail of the domesticated sheep, it has been pointed out, is always longer, sometimes considerably longer, than in wild sheep, and in some breeds it presents a further peculiarity in that it becomes loaded with fat, till it may attain a weight of as much as forty pounds, as in the common sheep, which is kept also by the Arabs, who regard it, fried in slices, as a rare delicacy. In this animal the tail does not reach below the hocks, but it is of great breadth, measuring as much as a foot across. But in the cape, fat-tailed sheep it is much longer, and may trail on the ground, it never, however, attains to the width seen in the Syrian sheep. 
The opposite extreme, in this matter of tails, is found in a large, lop-eared sheep, ranging from southern Siberia to the Kyrgyz steppes, wherein the tail is reduced to a minute vestige, while an enormous accumulation of fat is developed on the hindquarters, weighing from thirty to forty pounds. This fat, semi-fluid and butter-like, constitutes the great bulk of Russian tallow. The fat rump of sheep used by the Israelites in sacrifices seems to show that in biblical times fat-rumped sheep were kept in Palestine. These sheep, by the way, are singularly colored, the head, neck, and legs being black, and the rest of the body white. They are also hornless. Our British sheep are commonly divided into long-wooled, down, and mountain breeds. But this leaves out of account one of the most interesting, because the most primitive, of all. This is the little animal known by the uncouth name of Logton, mouse-colored, of the Isle of Man. This, at any rate, is the type. But very similar sheep are found throughout the Outer Hebrides and in Soe, in the St. Kilda group, the Shetlands, and north yet to the Faroes and Iceland. Three features distinguish the sheep of this type, small size, short tail, and brown coloration. Further, there is a tendency to increase the number of horns, of which there may be as many as three pairs. For the most part, sheep are kept for the sake of their wool, flesh, or milk, while the skin is used for parchment. But there is a tall, long-legged sheep known as the hunia, which is used for carrying salt and borax over the Himalayan passes. Both sexes are horned, and in the male there may be four horns. Another Himalayan sheep, known as the barwell sheep, a near relation of the hunia but shorter-legged, is used in the Punjab and other parts of India as a fighting sheep, being pitted in combat, either with its fellows or with other animals. This is the fighting ram of India, and displays remarkable courage. The shock with which two rams meet is astounding, the sound of the impact of their heads being audible at a distance of two or three hundred yards. Finally, because showing how amenable to domestication the sheep has proved, it must be mentioned that in some of the Orkneys, where no other provender exists, the little sheep of the Loagton type are fed upon fish, which are dried upon the rocks for that purpose. By way of a change of diet, they will make their way down to the sea at low tide, for the purpose of feeding upon seaweed. Goats Let him who talks glibly of separating the sheep from the goats assay his hand at the attempt and he will find that he has undertaken a task several sizes too large for him. At any rate, the man of science has not yet succeeded in achieving this feat. The matter is not easy even when domesticated animals alone are concerned, but when a sharp line has to be drawn between wild sheep and wild goats, the difficulties become insurmountable. But since we are concerned here only with the domesticated goat, no useful purpose would be served by discussing the nature of these difficulties at length. The earliest known domesticated goat, it is to be noted, is obviously derived from the existing wild goat, Capra agargus, of the Mediterranean Isles, Asia Minor, and Persia. One of the most striking and most valuable of domesticated goats is the Kashmir or Tibetan shawl goat, which has developed a thick woolly underfur from which the famous Kashmir shawls are made. This animal is kept in enormous flocks in Ladakh and Tibet. It is a long-horned, lop-eared animal, and varies in color from white to black. No less valuable is the Angora goat of Asia Minor. This is a large animal with long spiral horns resembling those of the markhor and long pendant ears, a foot long. But its value lies in its long silky white hair, which may reach almost to the ground, and is used for the manufacture of a peculiar kind of cloth known as mohair. Some authorities hold that this animal is a direct descendant of the wild markhor. If this be so, then we have direct evidence of the derivation of domesticated goats from two distinct wild stocks. 
the remarkable persistence to type which some breeds of domesticated animals display is strikingly illustrated by the syrian and theban goats since both were cherished by the ancient egyptians who painted them in their frescoes and mummified their bodies thus then we can say of a certainty that these two breeds are many thousands of years old yet in all this time they have hardly changed under certain conditions the domesticated goat may become a really formidable animal entirely changing the economic conditions of vast tracts of country and this is owing to its preference for browsing on woody shrubs and seedling trees rather than on grass like the sheep as a consequence even in the most deserted parts of palestine they have destroyed the forests and similarly they have devastated the island of st helena in other parts of the world cattle and the camel have wrought like destruction producing barren wastes where once flourished luxuriant forests end of section eighteen section nineteen of the outline of science volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Richard The Outline of Science, Volume 4, by J. Arthur Thompson Chapter 36, The Story of Domesticated Animals, Part 2 Section 4, Pigs Cattle, sheep, and pigs, wherever we wander about the countryside, are always so intimately associated that it is difficult to think of one without thinking of all three, and they have come to us thus linked together from the days of the Stone Age. One can hardly conceive it possible that the domestication of all three began simultaneously. Indeed, the evidence so far as it goes seems to show that the pig was the last of the trio to give hostages to man. But it would seem that man lost no time in adding to his responsibilities as a stockkeeper, when once he had appreciated the advantages to be gained by the possession of flocks and herds. How much of this choice was due to intuition, and how much to selection from a number of different animals kept for experiment, we shall never know. But he must have congratulated himself on his subjection of the pig, whose toothsomeness had long been known to him from the flesh of boars, and occasionally sucking pigs slain in the forests. Our domesticated pigs have been derived from two distinct stocks. The wild boar is the ancestor of the northern European breeds, while those of southern Europe, Asia, and Africa have been derived from one of the Malayan pigs, possibly the collared pig, Sus vitatis. It is surely not a matter for surprise that in the course of 10,000 years or so of idleness and domesticity, one should remark a considerable loss both of litheness and intelligence as compared with their wild relations. The boars display a considerable degeneration in regard to the size of their still formidable tusks, while both sexes have developed a great facility for putting on fat, and this at the expense of their hairy coats. All wild pigs, when young, have longitudinally striped coats. This is never the case with domesticated pigs, but these have no need of such camouflage. Apart from the transformation due to fat, domesticated pigs have changed chiefly in the great increase in the size of the ears and the very striking shortening of the face seen in breeds like the Middle White Yorkshire and the Berkshire breeds. There is a very remarkable breed of solid-hoofed pigs, in which the two front toes are enclosed in a single sheath. It now chiefly survives in America, where it is cherished under the belief that it is immune to swine fever, though there seems to be no very certain evidence that this is the case. Finally, all domesticated pigs seem to have developed a curious semicircular twist in the tail, for which no explanation has yet been offered. Section 5. Dogs. Those ancient hunters, the Azilians, apparently despised art, but they laid the foundations of tremendous events, the domestication of animals. True, they got no further than the mastery of the dog to aid and abet them in their hunting, 
perchance because already their game was growing scarce and more wary from constant harassing. But this conquest over wild nature was a great beginning, and there can be no doubt but that it had a profound influence over man's future destiny. For 7,000 years, unfortunately, we cannot fix the precise date when the first dog pulled down the first year at his master's bidding. The dog has been the man's most intimate companion and servant. That first dog, we may be almost certain, was a wolf. Later, there is good evidence to show the jackal was in like manner enlisted. From these two stocks, our dogs of today are descended. Bearing this in mind, we shall the more easily appreciate the almost infinite variety which confronts us in any survey of the breed of dogs which the records of the past and of the modern show bench have preserved to us. In using the term wolf, it should be remarked that it includes not only the European wolf, but also the Indian wolf, Canis palaps, and the North American coyote, C. latrans. When immigrants from the east settled down to form the earliest Swiss lake dwellings during the Stone Age, they brought with them dogs derived from the Indian wolf, and these, no doubt, must have hastened the evolution of new types by crossing with the Azilian dogs derived from the European wolf. The desire to raise a strain of dogs for some special purpose, or to satisfy the love of developing more freakishness, has indeed borne fruitful results. Inasmuch as we can now recognize no fewer than six distinct types, the wolf-like group, greyhound group, spaniel group, hound group, mastiff group, and terrier group. Among the wolf group, we have Eskimo dogs, sheep dogs, collies, and the pariah dogs of Eastern Europe, Asia, and Africa. Among the greyhounds, the English and Italian greyhound, deerhound, Irish Wolfhound, and the Great Borzois. The Spaniels include giants like the Newfoundland, and dwarfs like the useless little Pekingese and Japanese Spaniels, as well as the Field and Water Spaniels. Bloodhounds, Staghounds, Foxhounds, Otterhounds, Dachshunds, Pointers, and the Dalmatian Carriage Hound represent the Hound group, wherein the power of scent is developed in a remarkable degree. A long list of names such as this does not make very entertaining reading, but con it again and reflect that it stands for man's achievements in the manipulation of flesh and blood during some 7,000 years, and it at once assumes a new significance. Read it again, trying to visualize the appearance of these animals. Eskimo dogs, sheep dogs, collies, and pariah dogs. Eskimo dogs trained to draw strange-looking, fur-swathed people in sledges over the snow. Collies and sheepdogs rounding up flocks of silly sheep with a skill surpassing that of man himself. Think of the bond of sympathy between the master and servant. Pariah dogs, outcasts, every man's hand against them, yet contriving to hold their own in spite of buffetings in sun-scorched eastern streets. Look at the lithe and graceful greyhound, kept for no other purpose than to coarse hairs during the chill short days of winter. His forebears, prick-eared but otherwise not very different, were cherished by the ancient Egyptians, embalmed when they died, and portrayed in vivid colors on monuments. To serve the ends of sport alone, man has created, so to speak, an almost bewildering number of breeds, and the behavior of some of these demonstrate a high degree of canine intelligence, as, for example, in the case of the Retriever and the Pointer. The St. Bernard, a near relation of the Great Newfoundland, has been assigned another role. His part is to discover and succor the lost in deep snowdrifts on terrible mountain passes, whereat he has won fame imperishable. There are few dogs which do not inspire affection. Many crave it but there are some which seem to repel us, like the bloodhound. True, man has made him what he is. Terrible to look at and terrible to encounter, man has raised him up to hunt down his fellow man. Hence the poor beast is shunned alike by innocent and guilty, but as a product of man's capacity to guide, if not to control, the evolution of a given type, the bloodhound is really a remarkable animal. Selection in Breeding 
As a witness to the subtle and subconscious directness of the human mind, the evidence furnished by the domesticated dog is valuable indeed. By careful selection of his breeding stock and shrewd matings, man has, so to speak, inveigled nature to fashion for him just the kind of dog he wanted for a particular purpose. In make and shape and temperament, he has contrived to attain very near to his ideal. And this is as true of the dogs which he has brought into being, as with a magician's wand, to please his fancy for freakishness, as well as of those desire to satisfy his needs. The bulldog of the show bench, which is a modern innovation, well illustrates this point. His prototype, bred for the barbarous and singularly brutal sport of bull baiting, bore but a slight likeness to the animal known as a bulldog today. This poor creature, heavy-bodied, bow-legged, and underhung, unable to walk a mile and with defective breathing passages and bad teeth, would have been absolutely useless in the bull ring. His only merit today lies in his ugliness. It has taken something like a hundred years to bring this animal to its present state of perfection, and the only useful purpose which can be urged for this expenditure of mental energy on the part of his creators is that it shows what can be done in the direction of evolving new types by persistently breeding from animals which promise to show exaggerations of certain salient features pleasing to the capricious fancy of the devotees of the breed. And what is true of the bulldog is also true of lap dogs, like Pekingese, pug dogs, and the little woolly doormats known as Maltese Terriers. And now a word as to edible dogs. To the Western mind, this sounds a repulsive form of food. Today, the principal dog eaters are the Chinese, who keep the chow chow for this purpose, and the natives of the Society Islands. The natives prefer dog to pork, and if we were to believe Captain Cook, between a South Sea dog and English lamb, there is little to choose. The Eskimos have a fondness for foxes, which the Stone Age people also apparently regarded as a delicacy. Hence, it seems that the taste for dog flesh is a very ancient one. Section 6. Cats. Stone Age man boasted no household, hence he had no cat. For the domesticated cat is before all things a household animal, living idly, and rendering no service for the shelter afforded save catching an occasional mouse for sport. When civilization had, so to speak, got into its stride and man had an abiding resting place and started keeping pets, the cat appeared. When its domestication actually began, we do not know, but it had very definitely established itself with the ancient Egyptians of the 20th dynasty, that is to say about 1000 BC so much so that it had come to be regarded as a sacred animal and was embalmed at death, as witnessed the mummied cats in the British Museum. Cats are far more stereotyped creatures than dogs. That is to say, they are by nature prone to go on, generation after generation, with an almost machine-like precision in regard to their structural characteristics and hence they offer no new features upon which the breeder might seize for the development of new types. This much is shown by the fact that after some 3,000 years of domestication, we still have very few distinct breeds of cats. True, there are the tabby and the tortoise shell, which are nearly always females. Black cats and white cats, long-haired cats, strangely colored Siamese cats, and cats with bobtails. They are all cast in the same mold, differing only superficially. And this even though descended from several distinct but closely related wild ancestors, of which the Egyptian wildcat may be taken as the type. There is one point about our domesticated cats which is not only extremely interesting, but also very puzzling, and this concerns the pattern of the coat, which presents two quite distinct types. In the one, the head is longitudinally and the body transversely striped, after the fashion of the European wildcat and the Egyptian cat. In the other, the body is marked by broad bands, roughly spiral on the flanks. This type represents the true tabby, 
the word having reference to the well-known pattern of watered silk. Cats of all colors may be thus marked. Even when the two types are crossed, the several members of the litter will present both types, but no suspicion of blending. Some will be striped, and some will be tabbies. No explanation of these very striking differences seems possible. Section 7. Rabbits. We are dealing in these pages not so much with domesticated animals as with the domestication of animals, for this is an outline of science dealing with principles rather than with details. In considering domesticated rabbits, for example, it is a matter of no profit to know the names of all the numerous breeds of these animals. That information concerns the fancier, and even he generally confines his attention to one or two breeds. Rather, we are concerned with these questions. Firstly, why were rabbits and not hares domesticated? And secondly, how is it that the species Lepus cuniculus, the common wild rabbit, has come to be the ancestor of our tame rabbits rather than any one of a number of other species of wild rabbit? More than this, one is tempted to ask how came there to be domesticated rabbits at all? No definite answer can be given to these questions. But we may imagine that when once man discovered the many and great advantages that would follow from his ability to create a permanent supply of beef and mutton by taming wild sheep and oxen, he began to experiment with all kinds of wild species, either because they promised to furnish him with the necessaries of life or pleasure in the contemplation of beasts and birds kept as pets. He probably experimented with both hares and rabbits, and found the latter were readily amenable to domestication, while hares were not. There is no evidence to show that the domestication of the rabbit is of any very great antiquity, yet some very remarkable breeds have been produced, such indeed as could never contrive to exist in a wild state, as for example the lop-eared rabbit. This, in bodily size, far exceeds the ancestral wild rabbit, from which it further differs in the enormous size of its ears, which may measure as much as 28 inches long and 6 inches wide. No wild rabbit could exist, whose ears trailed along the ground with its every movement. The long, woolly-haired angora is another striking transformation of the original wild rabbit, while in point of size the Flemish giant is equally remarkable a full-grown buck sometimes weighing over 14 pounds. Section 8. Elephants, Camels, and Llamas The domestication of the elephant, camel, and llama support the view already put forward here, that man's choice of domesticated animals has in no small degree been determined by force of circumstances. That is to say, he brought into subjection the most adaptable of the wild animals nearest to his hand. The Indian elephant alone, of the two existing species, has proved amenable to domestication. Even this but seldom breeds in captivity, so that the stock has continually to be replenished by wild-caught animals, which present a most surprising amenability to captivity. Of the two species of camel, one, the Arabian camel, has so long been extinct as a wild animal that we are unable to say with certainty whence the first of the domesticated stock was derived. Of the Bactrian, or two-humped species, it is said that a few wild animals are still to be found in the remote parts of Turkestan. Both species not only breed readily, but they can be freely crossed. Among the Yoruks of Asia Minor, the resultant hybrids, or mules, are preferred to either of the pure breeds. The western side and the southernmost parts of South America harbor some near relations of the camels of the Old World, the llama and the alpaca. These are domesticated breeds of wild species. Up to the time of the Spanish conquest, the Peruvians possessed neither horses, cattle, nor sheep. They were dependent on the llama alone for meat, milk, and clothing, and for beasts of burden and this beast still continues to fulfill the several needs of their owners, even though domesticated animals, horses, cattle, and sheep have been introduced from Europe. The alpaca is of little use as a transport animal, but it provides a most valuable wool for clothing. 
Section 9. The Taming of the Birds Turning now from mammals to birds, we find that here also man has made some signal conquests, though it would seem that he did not try his hand at the subjection of the fowls of the air until he had evolved a comparatively stable mode of life. Migration, accompanied by flocks and herds, was not only easy, but necessary. During these peregrinations, however, it would be impossible to transport feathered livestock. Probably the earliest of his experiments was made upon ducks and geese. The mallard then, as now, proved readily amenable to domestication, as also did the grey lag goose. Of the two, however, the mallard has proved the more plastic. This is shown by the fact that it has given rise to a greater variety of breeds, exhibiting a wider diversity of structure, size, and coloration than is the case with the goose. The pigeon was a still later conquest. Our domesticated pigeons have all been derived from the rock dove, which, in the hands of the fancier, has undergone some really extraordinary transformations, as may be seen on reference to the color plate facing page 1124. Our domesticated game birds are represented by the common fowl, the guinea fowl, the turkey, and the peacock. As with the pigeon, these are all relatively recent additions to man's possessions. The common fowl is a descendant of the Indian jungle fowl, Gallus bankova. Like the blue rock pigeon, this bird has proved to be singularly prone to variation. The number of known breeds, past and present, is positively bewildering. Almost every conceivable change in the matter of coloration and feathering has taken place, while the soft parts, represented by the comb and waddles, have in like manner assumed strange developments. Today, the trend of the breeder is to produce severely utilitarian breeds, his aim is to secure birds with prodigious egg-laying powers, or birds for the table. But there is one fact which has escaped him. His table birds are growing steadily less and less weighty in regard to just that portion of their anatomy which it is most to be desired should on the contrary increase, to wit, the breast muscles. These are the muscles which sustain flight, and as for generations untold, these muscles have ceased to be used, they are in consequence rapidly declining. No amount of selection can remedy this. The only possible hope of stemming this decline is to devise some means of making these birds use their wings. It would be beyond the scope of these pages to pass in review the well-nigh innumerable species of birds which man has succeeded in domesticating more or less completely, for aesthetic reasons, as cage birds. But we may cite the canary as an example, for this bird has now become so transformed that only an ornithological expert could identify it with its wild ancestor. Even its shape, in some breeds, has been changed. End of section 19. Recording by Mark Richard. Section 20 of The Outline of Science, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wayne Cook. The Outline of Science, Volume 4, by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 37, The Science of Health, Part 1. What is health. Health is a word which means so much and means so many things that it is impossible to compress its wide and varied significance within the compass of any brief definition. It is an ancient word, too, and it has been changing and widening in its connotation ever since it was conceived and born, and it is changing and widening still. As its derivation suggests, it originally meant something like wholeness, and probably referred to freedom from obvious bodily wounds and injuries, and had little or no reference to the deeper and obscurer vital processes. It is true that Hippocrates, the father of medicine, defined health physiologically as a condition in which, quote, each humor is in due proportion of quantity and force, 
but especially properly commingled. End quote. But physiology was very crude and empirical in those days, and Hippocrates did not know the difference between a vein and an artery, and could not distinguish between a nerve and a tendon, while Aristotle taught that the brain was a sponge to keep the blood cool, which is good metaphor, but bad physiology. The work of Galen made it possible to have a clearer view of the physiology of health, and today, when physiology has become a great science, some very definite physiological ideas dominate the meaning of the term health, as used by doctors and scientific men. The body is now regarded as a chemical and physical system, and by health, we mean mainly useful, efficient, and harmonious production of energy, a matter depending more upon general functional harmony and perfection than upon anatomical integrity. Health as Working Capacity The conception of health as working capacity, founded on chemical and physiological basis, becomes even more definite and precise with the advance of chemistry and physiology and their sister sciences, for we find out more and more the factors which affect energy income and output. Today, we may put a little thermometer under a man's tongue, and if it reads 102 degrees Fahrenheit, we can say with certitude that that man is out of health, and that he is as incapable of full work as an overheated engine. Or we may listen to a man's heart, and find that its valves leak, and we may justly conclude that it is as inefficient for work as a leaking pump. Or we may test a drop of a man's blood, and decide that the man is in bad health, since he lacks oxygen to keep his furnaces going full blast. Or we may find a microbe in a man's veins, and know that his energy must quickly fail. Or we may count a man's pulse, and find it 140, and judge at once that he is out of health and unfit for work. On the other hand, we may find that a man's temperature is 98.4 degrees Fahrenheit, that his heart is as sound as a bell, that his blood is pure, that he has no microbes in his veins, and that his pulse is 72 and of good quality, and even if the man has lost an arm or a leg or an eye, we can label him healthy and can safely infer that he has normal health, that is, normal capacity for work. In fact, all our accumulating knowledge of physiological processes make for precision in our conception and measurement of health. The Energy of Food Regarded as a material system for the development and regulation of energy, a living animal organism is in many ways a mechanical marvel. Like other machines, it requires fuel, and, as in the case of other machines, its fuel is mostly carbon. But the carbon of food, not the carbon of coal or oil. Now, the carbon of food is the very same carbon which the red rays of the sun tear from the carbon dioxide of the atmosphere in the laboratory of the green leaf. The wrench of the sun sets the carbon vibrating with new energy, and when it is afterwards built into starch, the energy is latent there and is delivered to the animal which eats the starch, or fat, or sugar, or protein constructed out of the starch, and is manifested as actual animal energy as soon as the food is oxidized in the animal's tissues, just as coal gives off its energy as heat when it is oxidized in a furnace. Parentheses. When another element combines with oxygen, as carbon in particular so readily does, we speak of it as being oxidized. The process is one of combustion, in which heat and energy are liberated. End parentheses. If we put glowing carbon into a jar of oxygen, it oxidizes quickly and burns fiercely, while if we put the carbon of our food in contact with the oxygen carried by red blood corpuscles, it oxidizes slowly and burns quietly, heating the body usually only to 98.4 degrees Fahrenheit, and manifesting itself not only in heat, but in chemical, mechanical, and electrical energy. But in each case, the process is essentially a freeing of solar energy previously imparted to the carbon. 
Our bodies, therefore, are sun machines, worked by the red rays of a star 93 million miles away, radiated, it may be, a million years ago. When Gibernat, for instance, consumed soup made of a mastodon's teeth, he put into his heartbeat the carbon of the food crushed by the monster's molars hundreds of thousands of years ago. And the carbon had probably been energized in some tree fern by the tropical sunlight of that prehistoric era. Gimbernet really drank in his soup not only the gelatin from the monstrous molars, but also starch from the prehistoric trees and the red light of a prehistoric sun. We are not at all so prehistoric in our meals as that, but every man lives and moves by virtue of the red light of the sun which he consumes with his porridge or potatoes or beefsteak or bread and butter. We cannot wink an eyelid without liberating the energy of these red rays from our culinary carbon. Chemically speaking, foods are divisible into carbohydrates, such as starch and sugar, fats, such as butter, and proteins, such as white of egg and meat. All such foods can be oxidized by burning, and their value as energy producers can be estimated by the heat they give off during their combustion. We estimate heat in calories, a calorie being the amount of heat required to raise one gram of water one degree centigrade. And we find on burning these three kinds of food and oxygen that one gram of carbohydrate produces 1.4 calories of heat, one gram of fat, 9.3 calories, and one gram of protein, 4.1 calories. Heat is, of course, a form of energy and is changeable into definite amounts of other forms of energy, such as muscular motion. And it is known that a calorie of heat is equivalent to the energy required to raise a weight of 425.5 grams one meter. Thus, it is quite easy to calculate how much heat and muscular energy should be given to the body by the slow oxidation in its tissues of certain amounts of food. And if we put a man in a special chamber called a calorimeter, where the amount of heat and of other forms of energy he expends could be measured, it will be found that he produces about as many calories of heat and other forms of energy as his food would produce if burned outside the body. Accordingly, if we know how much energy a man expends under various conditions, it is not difficult to calculate the food he requires. All living involves expenditure of energy, breathing and thinking, as well as manual or physical exercise. It is also easy enough from figures of food consumption to find out how many calories are contained in the average man's diet. Before the war, the average Englishman consumed 3,422 calories of energy in his food. During the war, the Royal Society Food Committee came to the conclusion that the average man required 3,390 calories of energy, so that the average man would seem to have adapted his diet to his requirements very successfully. To keep the heart beating and the other organs working, and to maintain the temperature of the body, about 2,836 calories were required on the average, and any calories in excess of the requirements are available for muscular energy. Only about 20%, however, of the calories available can be converted into actual muscular work. The rest is dissipated as heat. 20% seems a small portion of work, but it is a larger proportion than can be obtained from any steam engine. Proportions of different kinds of food. In view of these facts, it might seem that a man has only to swallow so many calories of energy in his food in order to get so many calories of work from his muscles. And we find men who are foolish enough to eat huge quantities of food in order to gain strength. But food must be carefully chosen. It must be also suited in quantity to the boiler capacity of the man and to his digestive, respiratory, and circulatory potentialities. We must not take foods indiscriminately, 
we must take certain proportions of carbohydrates, of fats, and of proteins. And the last is particularly necessary, providing not only fuel to work the body, but also material to build it up and to repair its waste. For it must be noticed that the body machine not only does work, but also builds up and repairs itself. We must also take such forms of these food materials as the digestive organs can digest, and we must consider their digestive capacity. Further, we must consider the oxidizing capacity of the blood, heart, and respiration for the carbon of the food that is of no value for work unless there be oxygen to burn it. A man who is to obtain much energy from large quantities of food must have all his organs strong and efficient, otherwise the food will be wasted. A man of powerful constitution may be able to digest and utilize perhaps 10,000 calories in 24 hours. But all men are not made that way, and it is perhaps just as well they are not. It is not necessary for a man to weigh out so many calories of food, and indeed it is always better for a man to weigh himself than to weigh his food. If he finds his weight becoming unduly great, that is proof positive that he is eating more than he can turn or is turning into energy, while if he finds he is losing weight, and if there is no disease to account for the loss, that is proof presumptive that he is consuming his own tissues in the production of energy, and could therefore utilize more food for the purpose, if it were given him. Further, an observant man will soon discover, with a few scientific principles to guide him, what foods and what quantity of food result in the best output of energy. The trouble, of course, is that men are often careless or unobservant or self-indulgent. A very busy man neglects his dietary till suddenly he finds his bones sticking through his skin and his energy unequal to his daily work. Part 1. The three classes of foods, as we have said, are carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. These are the foods proper, that is to say, the substances whose oxidation gives man his supply of energy. But besides these foodstuffs proper, man must add to his dietary certain other substances which are necessary for the complete digestion, assimilation, and utilization of these main articles of diet. He must include in his menu certain amounts of the remarkable liquid, water. He must also make sure that his dietary contains certain salts, such as common salt, and certain mysterious substances called vitamins. But in ordinary dietaries, there is always water added in some form or other, and in any properly varied dietary, containing milk, meat, bread, and vegetables, there are plenty of vitamins. Importance of Vitamins The vitamins, or accessory food factors, have introduced a new idea into the theory of dietetics which is independent of any question of calories. These substances are present in foodstuffs in such small amounts as to be valueless in themselves as sources of energy, but in some way not yet understood, they are essential to the health, growth, and even life of the body. They have not been isolated or chemically defined, but it is now becoming well known what foodstuffs contain them and what diets produce the disastrous results which mark their absence. They are all ultimately products of the plant world. Lack of one of these accessory food factors causes scurvy, a disease which was commoner in the days of sailing ships and of consequent long periods without fresh food. Lack of another causes the nervous disease known as beriberi, which has a curious history. Some native races of India live largely on rice, and when machine rolling began to replace the more primitive methods, beriberi became rampant. It was then found that the machines husked the rice grains too efficiently, and that it was the lack of some ingredient in the husks, formerly eaten in large part, that caused the disease. Careful experiments in the feeding of pigeons confirmed the result, 
and when the knowledge was gained, the remedy was simple. The third accessory of food factor is an ingredient of animal fats, notably of cod liver oil, and seems to play an important part in the physiology of growth and in the prevention of rickets. All these substances, as has been said, exist in sufficient quantity in a well-varied dietary. But wherever we get restrictions in the nature of the diet, however ample the mere quantity of food, there's a danger that one or other being present in insufficient degree. During the siege of Cute, there was scurvy among the British troops and beriberi among the Indians. And even at home, the question was an important one to those responsible for controlling and rationing the nation's food supply. In the feeding of infants and invalids, in the rationing of exploring expeditions and of military forces on active service, and in the food supplies of the poor, special attention requires to be paid to providing adequate vitamins. Without these, no mere sufficiency of quantity, no mere numbers of calories, no mere increase of proteins, carbohydrates, or fats as such will be of any avail in the preservation of proper health. Enjoying Food The whole organic well-being of a man depends on his food, and no man can have that harmonious output of useful energy which we call health if he eat too much or too little food or if his digestion be inefficient. Digestion, however, begins in a sense in the olfactory organ and ends in that colloid solution which constitutes living protoplasm. And indigestion is very often not due to any deficiency of the digestive organs, but can be attacked and cured on quite other grounds. To digest food properly, we must enjoy it and the man who does not enjoy his food is unlikely to enjoy anything else. In parentheses. And to enjoy it thoroughly, we must smell it and taste it. The smell and taste of food makes the mouth water, and that is the beginning of digestion. But the smell and taste, as the Russian scientist Pavlov showed, also cause the stomach to water. To eat food in the spirit of dust to dust I commit, is to invite indigestion and ill health. And many people suffer from ill health simply because they have never learned to enjoy their food. The improvement of health, that is, the increase of energy, that often follows more thorough mastication, is largely due to stimulation of the digestion through the senses of smell and taste. The digestive juices stimulated by the sense of taste and smell, were called by Pavlov psychic juices, and they undoubtedly play a big part in preliminary digestion. Another cause of indigestion is certainly the lack of fresh moving air in dining rooms. Without fresh moving air, we cannot have sufficient respiration and circulation, and without efficient respiration and circulation, the process of secretion and assimilation associated with digestion cannot function properly. Muscular development may be exaggerated. The great majority of people have digestions quite capable of supplying them with all the energy they can pleasurably and profitably employ. There is no great advantage in the possession of large muscles and great muscular energy. So far as energy of that kind is concerned, a flea or grasshopper or ant or beetle can put man to shame. Perfect health is possible without unusual muscular development, muscular strength, or muscular endurance and the various health systems that devote themselves to developing and strengthening muscles are usually a mistake from the point of view of energy. For at best, big muscles can manifest mighty energy only for a few years, and the energy they use means unnecessary work for all the vital organs. It is waste of the wonderful potential energy of the carbon compounds. In bygone times, muscular energy was of value in the struggle for existence. The man who could draw a stout bow or swing a heavy battle axe or even carry a big load had vital advantages over the man with weaker arms and legs. 
But even then, muscular strength did not count for everything, for man managed to extirpate many animals ten times stronger than himself. Now in these days of rifles and poison gases and machinery, muscle plays a subordinate part in life. From the carbon of his food, a man may obtain a few hundred calories of energy for his two arms. But the energy of coal now supplies every man with about as many arms as Briarius. And their energy of oil carries a man in his motor car as far as one hour as his legs could carry him in ten. Muscular energy, beyond a certain point, is no longer worth the candle. And a man may be all the healthier in the fullest sense of the word healthy, and that he requires and uses only a moderate amount of muscular energy. The chief advantage, indeed, of coal and machinery is that they liberate man's energy for higher tasks than hewing wood or carrying water. The average man does not now require to make his heart and other vital organs labor on behalf of his muscles. He can make his muscles labor on behalf of his vital organs, and especially on behalf of his brains. He can take muscular exercise to develop his breathing capacity, to strengthen the grip of his heart, to improve his circulation, and to stimulate his digestion, and all for the sake of his intellectual and aesthetic life. Not only the idea of wholeness, but also the idea of values enters into the modern conception of health, and a man who exercises all his energies harmoniously and in proportion to their spiritual and social value must be considered healthier than a man with the digestion of an ostrich, the strength of an ox, and the brains of a guinea pig. Exercise. For intellectual work, Little food is required over and above what is needed by the heart and lungs and for the maintenance of the body heat, and it is certain that most men, other than manual workers, eat more food than is necessary for the muscular and nervous energy they expend. It is equally certain that many men unnecessarily expend much more energy and muscular movement than is good for their mental constitution. Yet muscular exercise in moderation after food, in moderation, increases the sum total of the energies. A normal man can dance, walk, swim, play golf or cricket, and take other forms of exercise, and by such exercises so increase his digestive, respiratory, and circulatory powers that even after the expenditure of muscular effort, he has more energy available than before for higher purposes. Exercise, short of fatigue, is one of the best ways of facilitating the running of all the machinery of the body and of adding to the general store of energy. Some men seem to be able to maintain mental energy without it, but even the strongest man will suffer in some degree in his mental health and muscular efficiency if he do not exercise his muscular system and so promote the activity of all his vital organs happiness correlated with health. We have said that most men eat too much, or at least more than they require for the energy they expend. But it would be a mistake to carry asceticism too far. The food gives the body not only warmth and working power, it has also some subtle action on the character and temperament. A hungry man is an angry man. A well-fed man is often a warm-hearted man, and a fat man a contented man. Energy, even mental energy, is not everything, and it is sometimes wise to sacrifice a little efficiency for the sake of a little happiness. It is probably better to be happy and unhealthy than healthy and unhappy, parentheses, though the choice may seldom have to be made. In parentheses. For happiness liberates and directs energy even if it does not create it. On these grounds, and only doubtfully on these grounds, can the use of alcoholic drinks be justified. It is well proved now that alcohol has very little food value, 
and that even in small doses, it reduces energy and possibly shortens life. But if it gladden a sad heart, it gives both heart and brain more driving power and makes life more worth living. Food may be the best fuel for the machine, but where life's wheels great dry, happiness is a good oil. End of section 20. Section 21 of The Outline of Science, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matea Bracic. The Outline of Science, Volume 4 by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 37. The Science of Health. Part 2. Respiration and Circulation. So much for the relationship between food, muscular exercise and general health. But as we have already indicated, food and muscular exercise cannot be considered apart from respiration and circulation. If the food keep the heart and lungs going, no less do the heart and lungs give the food its driving power. We have already explained that the main source of the energy of the body is the energy liberated by the carbon on oxidation. The oxidation of the carbon is affected by the oxygen which is loosely combined with the colouring matter of the red blood corpuscules. The act of respiration brings oxygen to the blood and removes from it the carbon dioxide which collects in it as a result of the combustion of the carbon in the tissues. Except for the oxygen and the oxidation, the energy ultimately traceable to the solar rays might remain latent in the carbon compounds forever. Who knows for how many hundred thousand years the solar energy has been imprisoned in the mastodon's tooth, Er Gimbernat swallowed it in his soup, and oxidized it with the oxygen of his blood, and turned it into heat and motion? The regulation of both circulation and respiration is automatic. When a man does hard muscular work, his breathing automatically quickens and deepens in order to provide oxygen and remove carbon dioxide and the heart beats stronger and faster to carry oxygen to the tissues and carbon dioxide from them. During hard exercise, ten times as much oxygen may be consumed and ten times as much carbon dioxide discharged as during rest. Plainly, then, a man's muscular energy depends not only on the energy supplied to his muscles by his food, but also on his respiratory and circulatory efficiency. A man may have a good digestion, but if his lungs or his heart are diseased or impaired in their action, he will not have full energy. The three great systems must work in harmony, and the strongest member of the triple entente must accommodate itself to the capacity of the weakest. A man with a weak digestion must recognize the fact, and must cut his coat according to his cloth. The essence of health is harmonious energy and lack of health is largely disharmony. The average man does not require a large income and output of energy, but he requires such efficient and harmonious working of his vital organs as will make mental and physical work, within reasonable limits, not only possible, but pleasurable. And this happy consummation is within the average man's reach, if he eat, exercise and breathe wisely. Food and exercise we have already discussed. Let us now look for a moment at breathing. The breath of life. In recent years, a great deal has been written on the subject of breathing exercises. Breathing, however, is an automatic action, which never ceases from birth to death. An action, too, which is regulated by a series of nervous and chemical reflexes. And breathing exercises for a few minutes a day will have little effect on the total ultimate respiratory efficiency. The best breathing exercises are muscular exercises in the open air. Any exercise whatsoever that demands oxidation for muscular work will, as we have said, quicken and deepen the breathing. And the quickening and deepening will not, as in voluntary breathing exercises, stand by themselves. They will be an integral part of a general increase in vital activity. The chief desiderata are that the exercises should be qualified by the efficiency of the heart and lungs, and that they should be taken in the open air, so that plenty of oxygen may be ready to hand. 
Only in this way can the average activity of oxidation and the average output of vital energy be increased, and to the ordinary man leading a sedentary life, it is the average output of vital energy, the average output of mental energy, that matters. The body temperature. There are other things, however, even more important than muscular exercises for the maintenance of respiratory activity at a height conducive to mental and physical energy, and these things are temperature and skin reflexes. As we have already pointed out, about 80% of the energy value of food is manifested as heat, and the heat normally maintains the body at a temperature of about 98.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Since then, any increase in muscular energy means proportionate increase in heat production, there must also be increased loss of heat from the body, else the temperature of the body will rise. For instance, 200 calories of an increase in output of muscular energy will mean an increase of 800 calories in heat production. And if this extra heat be not conducted or radiated or evaporated away, the temperature of the body will rise. Briefly, there can be no increase of muscular energy without quicker production and loss of heat, and if loss of heat do not keep pace with production of heat, the temperature of the body will rise, and fever with disastrous results will follow. Nature meets this situation by taking measures to accelerate and facilitate the loss of heat. The skin becomes flushed with warm blood so that the heat can radiate away into the atmosphere, and the skin also becomes moistened with sweat, so that heat may be removed by evaporation. But it is plain that if the atmosphere be hot and damp and still, these measures will not be very efficacious, since both radiation and evaporation will be hindered, and in such a case nature wisely refuses to allow an increase in the output of energy. She takes away a man's appetite and slows down his vital machinery. We know that in hot, damp climates all men suffer from lack of energy, and that muscular work often means heat apoplexy. The climate under the clothes. The commonest cause of ill health, lack of appetite, lack of energy, lack of spirits, general tiredness, is nothing else than a damp, warm, still atmosphere, sometimes outside, sometimes inside, sometimes both outside and inside a man's clothes. In a warm tropical climate, the trouble is chiefly in the outside atmosphere, but many of those who do not live in the tropics like damp, warm, still air in their rooms, especially next to their skin and under their clothes. It is the climate under the clothes that is of the chief importance to health, and there are thousands of people in England who keep under their clothes the climate of a tropical marsh, hot, damp, stagnant. They render it impossible for heat to escape, and nature has to choose between giving them heat apoplexy and damping their furnaces. She chooses the less of the two evils and damps the damp man's furnaces, and he is ungrateful enough to complain of lack of appetite and lack of energy. Luckily for themselves, most men live in two climates at once. Their bodies, arms and legs languish in the tropics, while their face, neck, wrists, hands, ankles and sometimes feet carry on in a temperate or cold climate. In fact, face, neck, wrists, hands, ankles and feet act as radiators, and if it were not for these radiators, most English men and women would be as limp in London as in Zanzibar. If a man were to wear an undervest and a shirt and a waistcoat and a coat and an overcoat over his whole body, face, hands and neck, his energy would quickly flag. It is just his radiators that save him, and the open neck dresses that women have recently been wearing undoubtedly increase the energy of women by increasing their radiation. But such radiators are not enough. If a man wishes to enjoy energetic health, he must burn energetically and must permit free radiation from his whole body. We go to the hills and the seaside, and we at once feel invigorated, and say that the change of air has done us good. But there has been no change of air. It is just the same air as before, only it is air in motion with hill breezes or sea breezes, and it gets under our shirts, 
blows away the damp hot air there and increases radiation. Without adequate radiation, it is impossible for either the engines of the body or the engines of a motor car to work efficiently. Moving air within our walls and within our garments is a prime condition of good working capacity. The climate under the clothes is of importance not only from the point of view of loss of heat, but also from the point of view of loss of water. Under normal conditions of heat and exercise, the skin excretes about a pint of water every 24 hours. And during violent exercise, in great heat, quarts of water may be excreted. If the air under the clothes is saturated with moisture, not only is the cooling of the skin by evaporation hindered, with results we have already noted, but the excretion of water is retarded and the tissues are apt to get waterlogged. There are millions of sweat glands, with tubing altogether 20 or 30 miles long, and any interference with their free secretion reacts injuriously on the health. We have all experienced the tired feeling consequent on wearing an airtight and waterproof coat. A man living in a room full of warm still air is bound to have a damp subtropical climate under his waistcoat, unless he have actual open window ventilation and the ventilation of a room is not satisfactory unless it remove not only the vitiated air within the walls, but also the damp and vitiated air under the garments. Thorough ventilation is the draught in the furnace of vitality. In still other ways, the climate under the shirt is of great importance in the production of energy. In nature and origin, the skin and the brain are bound up together, and messages from the skin nerves play a great part in the initiation and regulation of impulses from the brain to the vital organs. A cold douche makes one gasp. A cool breeze restores a fainting man. Stimulation of the skin excites breathing movements in a newborn infant. And messages from the skin to the brain are followed by messages from the brain that bring about contraction or relaxation of the vessels of the skin to suit the temperature of the air. But when we surround the skin with a layer of warm, damp, stagnant air, we shut it off from the stimulus of moving air, and also from the stimuli of heat and cold, and no messages go from the skin to the brain urging it to quicken the respiration or increase the blood pressure. And so the nerve centres in the brain that control breathing and blood pressure become lethargic, and the vital functions suffer in their efficiency. A man whose whole skin is open to the stimulation of moving air, of heat and cold, and perhaps of light, will have more physical and mental energy than a man who protects his skin from these natural and healthful stimuli. Open air and light. The open air treatment of tuberculosis is based on the physiological principles which have just been explained. The patients are encouraged to live night and day in moving air. The result is that oxidation is encouraged and the energy of all the vital functions increased, not only as regards such functions as circulation and respiration, but also as regards the secretory and excretory functions, and the chemical processes that play a part in resisting microbes and their poisons. What exact part the sun's rays themselves may play in the matter is uncertain but recent research work suggests that it may be important, and that the chemical processes taking place in the blood are greatly affected by light. It is probable, therefore, that measures for abating the smoke nuisance in industrial centres are even more urgently required in the interests of health than had previously been supposed. End of section 21《Section 22 of the Outline of Science, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matea Bracic. The Outline of Science, Volume 4, by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 37. The Science of Health. Part 3. Sleep. There remains still to mention the most mysterious and one of the most important of all the factors relating to vital energy. A man may live for weeks or months without food, but he cannot live many days without sleep. Without sleep his energy quickly fails, 
however much food he may take, and however much oxygen may be at his disposal. Why sleep should be so essential, it is difficult to understand. Theoretically speaking, so long as digestion, circulation and respiration work, energy should be produced indefinitely, but in some way sleep is necessary for the continuance of vigour, especially as regards the brain and nervous system. The loss or partial loss of consciousness characteristic of sleep is probably due to a complex of causes, relaxation of certain blood vessels, accumulation of waste products, some kind of fatigue blockage in the nerves of sensation, and during the period of sleep the vital organs work more feebly and more oxygen is absorbed than expended. Sound deep sleep is essential if a man is to enjoy full vigour, and a great deal of lassitude and lack of energy is due to too late hours and too little sleep. Lucky men who can sleep as long as they wish should avail themselves of the gift, and not attempt to add to the length of their days by stealing a few hours from the night. But in many cases short hours of sleep are quite compatible with sound health. Brain workers especially seem able to maintain mental energy without many hours of sleep, and indeed sleep requirements seem to vary to a large extent in various individuals. When actual insomnia occurs, physical and mental energy diminish, and every effort should be made to get at the cause underlying the condition, for insomnia is not so much a disease as a symptom. The cause may be indigestion, fever, physical or mental fatigue, or even surplus energy. When any obvious causes such as these are found, the first thing to do is to remove them. Sleeping draughts, at all times very dangerous and pernicious things, are quite out of place in such cases. What is the use of giving an opiate to a man whose brain has been disturbed all night by messages of remonstrance from an overladen stomach? If insomnia be due to undigested food, the right and reasonable way to avoid it is by going to bed with an empty stomach. If again, as is sometimes the case, the brain is kept awake by a stomach requesting more food, a little food will be better than any soporific. If a man cannot sleep because he is not tired enough, the obvious remedy is to give him more work to do. And if he cannot sleep because he is too tired, the remedy of less work is obvious. Excitement, often quite pleasurable excitement, especially excited suspense, will often cause wakeful nights, and the cure, of course, is to avoid excitement, so far as possible, especially towards bedtime. People temperamentally excitable are particularly liable to insomnia, and in certain cases the only cure is the persistent cultivation of a calmer and more phlegmatic character. Excitement acts, to a large extent, by quickening the action of the heart and thus preventing the reduction of the blood flow to the brain, which is one of the essential preliminaries of sleep. And even apart from excitement, conditions of circulation sometimes cause excess of blood in the brain, and this can frequently be relieved by giving warm baths or hot drinks. Much more troublesome are cases of insomnia due to what is called worry. Worry is some unpleasant or irritating thought that possesses or obsesses the mind, very often some pressing problem that insists on solution. To a certain extent, worry is inevitable. Life for most people is full of problems that require to be solved, and that required persistence and concentration for their solution. In the darkness and silence of the night, these problems intrude and start trains of thought lying ready in the subconscious mind, and once these are started, they turn the brain into a weary and sleepless Sisyphus. There is no remedy for such worry insomnia, except to keep the mind during the day as much as possible from worrying matters. It must be noticed, too, that insomnia itself is apt to become a worry. The sleepless man lies awake worrying about his insomnia, and his emotional concentration on the subject renders sleep quite impossible. Possibly more harm is done to a man's health by worry over insomnia than by insomnia itself, and if a sleepless man can lie quiet, 
keep his mind on pleasant topics and take the whole matter philosophically, he will suffer very much less from loss of sleep than if he tosses about and frets and laments. We have talked of worry in relation to insomnia, but quite apart from insomnia, too persistent preoccupation with the dark side of life, with its anxieties and sorrows and problems, reduces health and energy. The energy which ought to go to the vital organs is in some way inhibited, and indigestion and other symptoms of organic disorder follow. It is a man's duty, both to himself and to other people, to look so far as possible at the bright side of things, and to cultivate the power of setting worries aside and of rising superior to at least the petty annoyances of daily life. To a great extent, avoidance of worry is a matter of the education of the will, but it is certain that a man living a healthy open-air life is more able to throw off cares and troubles than a man whose vitality has been reduced by unhealthy habits. Not only worry, in the usual sense of the term, but all unpleasant emotions have a pernicious effect on the health. Fear, hatred, envy, disappointment all depress and disturb the vital functions. A man suffering from a grievous disappointment loses his appetite. And in India, a man suspected of theft is given rice to chew, since if he be guilty, fear will dry up his mouth and render him unable to swallow the dry rice. And if it be true that worry and unpleasant emotions depress vitality, it is equally true that joyful emotions have the opposite effect. A merry heart goes all the day, your sad tires in a mile eh? is sound physiology, and equally sound physiology is expressed in a proverb, he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. It is not enough to resist depressing emotions, a man who is to make the most of himself must seek happy experiences. Health is necessary for happiness, but also happiness increases health. 4. We have stated that great energy alone does not constitute health, that the energy must be harmoniously coordinated to useful and, so far as possible, intellectual and spiritual ends. But the useful coordination of energy is the function of the nervous system, and in a sense, the nervous system is the real man. There is a preparation in the Royal College of Surgeons which shows the whole nervous system of a man dissected out from his body, and if there were some way of supplying such a nervous system with food and oxygen, we would have a conscious being that might be called a man. But take away the nervous system and the other organs and tissues would never be anything like a man. Thought, sensation and the regulation and coordination of the muscular movements, voluntary or involuntary, reside in the brain, spinal cord and nerves, including, of course, the wonderful nerve structures called the special senses. Without this nervous hierarchy, not a single useful movement could be performed, and life itself would be impossible. For without exquisitely regulated and coordinated action, the circulation and breathing could not go on. This wonderful system is to a certain extent, as we have already suggested, under the control of the will, and through it a man is able to have a good deal of influence indirectly on other organs not under will control, otherwise it would not be much use to write on the science of health, and again through the relationship of these to the nervous system he can influence the nervous system itself. Thus. Through the coordinating power of his nervous system, a man can feed himself, feed his heart and lungs, and through them can feed his brain and nerves. Accordingly, though the nervous system stands pre-eminent above all other systems, guiding and ruling them, it is dependent on the health of the other systems, and its health can be promoted chiefly by the measures which we have already mentioned when talking of the digestive, respiratory and circulatory systems. It is however particularly resistant to ill health. So long as there are food and oxygen to be had, the nervous system will clutch them, and it is the last organ in the body to suffer from undernutrition. It is essential that this should be so, for if the nervous system failed first, all the functions of the body would become chaotic and anarchical. When McSwiney starved himself, 
his mind remained active and clear almost to the very end on the other hand the nervous system especially the intellectual faculties of the brain is easily disordered by certain poisons circulating in the blood such poisons as the toxins of fever alcohol opium indian hemp but the chief hygienic peculiarity of the nervous system depends on the peculiar function of the brain as the organ of thought the health of the brain as an organ of thought depends not only on air and food but also on education the brain feeds on books and on thoughts quite as much as on bread and butter a single paragraph in a book may wind it up for days and a few words on a telegraph form may unlock thousands of calories of energy its coordinating its guiding its initiative powers its capacity for happiness and its capacity for giving happiness can be multiplied a thousandfold by education mental hygiene there is thus a hygiene of the mind as well as a hygiene of the body to achieve the ideal of men sana in corpore sano a healthy mind and a healthy body it is necessary to apply the fruits of the knowledge gained not only in the realm of physiology but also in that of psychology the mind no less than the body requires to be properly exercised and properly reposed and it must be given intellectual and emotional food of a suitable kind how important this is considered may be judged from the recent formation of a distinguished national council of mental hygiene to promote the study of the subject and the dissemination of knowledge on the questions involved in the particular field of industry also we have the young science of industrial fatigue the word is used not in its ordinary sense of weariness but in the scientific sense of reduced efficiency in this we find attention given both from a physiological and a psychological point of view to many problems of economy of effort of monotony of rhythm of vocational selection of spells of work and the introduction of rest pauses of factory conditions and the like and as our knowledge on these points increases so does our capacity to improve the well-being and happiness of the worker on the one hand and our industrial output on the other nervous ill health begins when a man's nervous system is so readily and so violently excited by stimuli that the nerve power is wasted and exhausted or when a man has such deficient nerve power that his nerve responses to stimuli are no longer easy and effective in the first case we say the man is nervous or neurotic he is always on the jump excitable irritable generally nervy and periods of exhaustion alternate with periods of excitement in the second case the man is nervously weak or neurasthenic he is always tired he lacks interest in life and initiative and enthusiasm the grasshopper is a burden and all the vital processes are depressed closely allied to these two conditions is hysteria both neurotic and neurasthenic conditions are to a certain extent innate the nervous system more than any other system is born not made and some men are born with over-excitable nervous systems and some with too little nerve vigour but both conditions can be bettered to a very great extent both by the education of the will and by the hygienic measures which we have already detailed in dealing with the other systems under proper hygienic treatment most neurotics can acquire steadier more stable nerves and most neurasthenics larger reserves of nerve energy in talking of health whether of body or mind it must always be recognized that there is no such thing as standard health no such thing as absolute health different men are healthy in different ways and to different degrees and it is necessary for each man to find out his own way of health and acquiesce in his own limitations a three-horsepower engine will not lift an aeroplane nor drive along a liner but it will work usefully and harmoniously in a motor bicycle and one of the commonest causes of breakdown in health is the employment of three horsepower engines to do three hundred horsepower work 
either mental or physical. The test and proof of health, indeed, will be found not so much in the amount of work done as in its smooth, facile efficiency, and in the happiness and pleasure found in its performance. Man is more than a working machine, and his work is to be judged not merely by its value in calories, but also by its emotional quality, and by the happiness it brings both to the worker and his fellow beings. 5. Bacteria, the fruitful source of disease. Although we are dealing here with health of the body, and not with its diseases, it is perhaps not going beyond our subject to remark on the great advance in recent years in the science of medicine, and in our knowledge of the human body. The discoveries connected with the ductless glands, and the part they play in the regulation of the body, have been referred to elsewhere. As explained in the article on biology, the ductless glands are organs which pour their secretions directly into the blood. Many of these secretions, or hormones, have an extraordinary power over the growth of the body, its rate of working and the cooperation of its parts. Many distressing conditions may result from the failure of one or other of the ductless glands to pour its proper secretions into the bloodstream. The whole chemistry of the body is deranged, but the trouble may often be remedied, as in the case of diseased thyroid, by administration of secretions prepared from the glands of animals. Bacteria have also been dealt with in a previous chapter. The increasing mastery of the microbe, that fruitful source of disease, is one of the triumphs of modern medical science. These injurious microscopic organisms invade the human body, liberate poisons and work incalculable havoc. By their activity they set up dangerous fevers, they also break down membranes and cause structural injuries of a serious kind. The science of bacteriology is young. While there remain still undiscovered many germs of particular diseases, hundreds of specific germs, unsuspected only a few years ago, have been discovered, and their life histories have been unveiled in the laboratory of the bacteriologist. There is a long list of diseases which are caused by infections with microorganisms, bacteria on the one hand, and protozoa, or single-celled animals, on the other. Thus, tuberculosis, typhoid or enteric fever, diphtheria, tetanus or lockjaw, anthrax, cholera, bacillary dysentery, and cerebrospinal or spotted fever are all caused by bacteria, each particular species causing its particular disease, while malaria, amoebic dysentery, and sleeping sickness are of protozoan origin. Other diseases remain which must be certainly ascribed to microorganisms of some kind, but for which no cause has yet been identified with certainty. These include scarlet fever, measles, whooping cough, and influenza. Probably the organisms in these cases are even more minute than those hitherto observed, and evidence is accumulating, as recently published researchers show, that there are organisms capable of passing through the fine filters used by bacteriologists. Luckily in the body we have two great counteractives to these organisms of disease. In the first place there are the phagocytes, wandering white cells in the blood which engulf and digest microbes. In the second place, the body has the power of producing antidotes against the deadly poisons, which the intruders liberate in their victim's blood. In various ways it is possible to increase the protective efficiency of both these natural defences of the body. In many cases it not only happens that a cure is effected, but that future attacks of the same disease are rendered either impossible or less serious. A dirty pinprick, for instance, may be the means of introducing into the body a host of deadly microorganisms. In the blood their numbers quickly multiply, until where there were thousands there are millions. A series of changes takes place in the blood and blood vessels. Soon there is a state of warfare in the body, a battle between the phagocytes, or white cells, the word phagocyte means eating cell, and the invading germs take place. The white blood cells squeeze through the vessel walls, and, in their thousands and millions, gather round a point of disturbance. Rapidly the jelly-like cell alters its shape, 
steadily surrounds one microbe after another until its body contains 10, 50, 100 or more. If the conditions are favourable to the white cells, the battle goes on until every microbe is absorbed by a cell, until the exudation, solid or liquid, is all reabsorbed and until the circulation of the blood in the part again becomes normal. The issue, however, may be very different. The numbers of the invading germs may be too great. Then millions of white cells die in the struggle, their bodies perhaps breaking up and liberating small quantities of antitoxin. The microcoxi, minute germs, too die in their millions, but their rate of increase is enormous and they continue to advance. To meet them come millions more of the white cells, absorbing their enemies, digesting them and producing the antidote to the poison of the microbes. If the microbes continue to gain the upper hand and invade the larger vessels of the body, the battle continues there. If the microbe meets its antidote, everywhere its warfare fails. If, however, the conditions are still unfavourable to the white cells, the microbes, dying in millions, produce more millions to continue the invasion. The war goes on until every defence is broken down. Then the slight inflammation of the pricked finger ends in a fatal blood poisoning. We have said that the body has the power of producing anti-substances to the poisons introduced by microorganisms. These substances are of various kinds. They include antitoxins, which are antidotes to the poisons of the disease, lysins and agglutinins, which help directly to destroy the invading germs, and the opsonins, a word meaning a sauce or seasoning, discovered by Sir Almroth Wright. These last seem to act indirectly by aiding the phagocytes, apparently making it easier for these white cells to take in and digest the particular organisms concerned. Artificial immunity One attack of certain diseases confers a passing or permanent immunity against another attack of the same kind, but although this fact is ancient knowledge, its inner meaning is as yet by no means fully understood. But acquired immunity, the immunity which one attack gives against a subsequent infection, has suggested a line of attack on infecting microorganisms. The invading organisms produce a toxin, or a mixture of several toxins, and in response to this, the body, as we have seen, produces an antitoxin, an antidote to the bacterial poison. But the process takes time, and the toxin always has a start and may even get control irrevocably. The question arises, therefore, as to whether the body cannot be made to produce its antitoxin beforehand. Then the further question, cannot the antitoxin be made outside the body altogether and held in readiness to be injected as soon as the disease becomes manifest? The earliest answer to the first of these questions dates from long before the era of modern scientific knowledge. Artificial infection from mild cases of smallpox was practiced in the East centuries ago as a protection against possible attacks of a severer nature, and the custom was introduced into this country early in the 18th century. It has since been superseded, however, by Jenner's discovery of vaccination, a safer method in which the artificial infection is with calf lymph containing the virus of cowpox, possibly a mild form of the same disease. Vaccination and improved sanitation have together banished smallpox from this country as a serious plague. The modern discovery and identification of the organisms that cause many diseases have led to a further modification in certain cases. In the protective inoculation against typhoid fever, for instance, it is dead bacteria, killed by heat sterilization, which are used. This process implies the administration of a definitely limited amount of toxin. The organisms not being alive cannot multiply in the body or produce further quantities of the poison. Anti-typhoid inoculation has proved immensely valuable, especially in the case of troops on active service, as was shown in the late war, although the immunity given in this case disappears after a few years. 
There are, of course, obvious practical limitations to the protective inoculation of entire populations against numerous diseases, and wider possibilities are opened up by the discovery of means of producing antitoxins and the like outside the human body. It is not possible to manufacture these substances artificially, for their subtle chemistry still eludes our research to a large extent, but they can be produced in the bodies of animals. The principle is the same as that already described, except that it is an animal which is inoculated with the killed bacteria or the toxins of the disease. Horses are commonly employed because of their conveniently large size. Gradually increasing doses are given so that the animal's health is not impaired, and when its blood is rich in anti-substances, quantities are drawn off from time to time. The blood serum is separated from the solids and subjected to various processes of purification and testing, and it is then made up for use on human patients who contract the disease. The diphtheria antitoxin is the best known example of this kind. It is purely an antitoxin, an antidote to the poisons produced in the body by the bacteria, and does not kill the organism themselves. These are dealt with by antiseptic treatment of the center of infection in the throat. In the case of some other diseases, however, sera are used containing anti-substances which are effective not only against the toxins, but also against the invading organisms. Without going further into the question, it will suffice to say that there is an ever-increasing number of diseases which are yielding to protective or curative measures based on the principle of acquired immunity. One important point, however, must be made clear. Immunity is not general against all or a number of diseases, but is quite specific. Immunity against one disease does not involve immunity against others. Each must be dealt with separately, and each presents to science its own peculiar difficulties. End of section 22 Section 23 of The Outline of Science, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chad Jackson. The Outline of Science, Volume 4, by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 23. Science and Modern Thought by the Editor It is not easy to define science. It is a system of knowledge built up on a basis of observation and experiment and compacted by reflection on the data thus supplied. Scientific knowledge is typically of such a kind that it can be verified by competent inquirers who repeat the observations and experiments and make them the subject of careful, independent reflection. Science is verifiable, communicable, impersonal, unemotional knowledge, but all the fields of science are not on the same level. Thus, Newton's Principia may be called very perfect science, but its range of communicability is limited. It is probably easier to be impersonal in astronomy than in ethnology. The Aim of Science The establishment of a science depends on processes of selection and detachment, what might be called isolating certain aspects of things. Thus the geologist does not as such concern himself with the beauty of the scenery, nor the astronomer with the majesty of the star-strewn sky. Nor does the physiologist primarily concern himself with the subjective aspect of life, though here the abstraction of metabolism from mind is less easy. The aim of science is to work out descriptive formulae, as short, as simple, as complete, and as consistent as can be devised. As Aristotle said, art, we should say science, begins when, from a great number of experiences, one general conception is formed which will embrace all similar cases. Science means unifying diversities and detecting uniformities. As Professor J. H. Pointing put it, in science, we explain an event not when we know why it happened, but when we know how, it is like something else happening elsewhere, when in fact we can include it as a case described by some law already set forth. 
as Professor Carl Pearson has said, the law of gravitation is a brief description of how every particle of matter in the universe is altering its motion with reference to every other particle. It does not tell us why particles thus move. It does not tell us why the Earth describes a certain curve round the Sun. It simply resumes, in a few brief words, the relationships observed between a vast range of phenomena. It economizes thought by stating in conceptual shorthand that routine of our perceptions which forms for us the universe of gravitating matter. This view of science as essentially descriptive is well suggested by Kirchhoff's famous statement of the aim of mechanics, to describe completely and in the simplest manner the motions that occur in nature. Many of the misunderstandings that have arisen in regard to science and religion, science and philosophy, and similar questions are due to a failure to recognize what science aims at, the formulation of things as they are and as they have come to be. The primary aim of science is not to explain, except in the sense of saying, this is a particular case of law X, or of saying, this is the outcome of that. It does not inquire into the why of things, the purpose or significance of the cosmos. That is not his metier. The Scientific Mood The scientific study of a subject implies a certain intellectual attitude or mood, which need not, however, be regarded as the only right of way. Thus, the aesthetic or poetic or purely practical approach to a subject may be not less legitimate than that of the scientific investigator. The scientific mood, which reaches very diverse degrees of development, is marked by 1. A passion for facts. This includes a high standard of accuracy and a detachment from personal wishes. 2. A cautious thoroughness in coming to a conclusion. This implies a persistent skepticism and self-elimination in judgment. 3. A quality of clearness, which includes a dislike of obscurities, ambiguities, and loose ends and 4. A less readily definable sense of the interrelation of things, an insight which discerns that apparently isolated phenomena are integral parts of a system. When a body of knowledge is very young or very elusive, there is apt to be a penumbra of what Faraday called doubtful knowledge. One must steer between uncritical easygoingness and expurgatorial intolerance. The Methods of Science in any scientific inquiry, the first step is to get at the facts, and this requires precision, patience, impartiality, watchfulness against the illusions of the senses and the mind, and the carefulness to keep inferences from mingling with observations. The second step is accurate registration of the data. In most cases, science begins with measurement. As Lord Kelvin said, nearly all the grandest discoveries of science have been but the rewards of accurate measurement and patient, long-continued labor in the minute sifting of numerical results. There is a certain quality of character here, and it is very significant that Clerk Maxwell should have spoken in one sentence of those aspirations after accuracy of measurement and justice in action which we reckon among our noblest attributes as men. A third step is arranging the data in workable form. A simple illustration being a plotted out curve which shows at a glance the general outcome of a multitude of measurements, such as the range of variability in a particular specific character in a plant or animal. The data may have to be expressed in their simplest terms, reduced perhaps to a common denominator with other sets of facts with which they have to be compared. There is the danger here of losing sight of something in the process of reduction. Thus, in reducing a fact of animal behavior to a chain of reflex actions, we may be losing sight of mind, or in reducing a physiological fact to a series of chemical and physical facts, we may be losing sight of life. The fourth step is when a whole series of occurrences is seen to have a uniformity, which is called their law. A formula is found that fits, the finding being sometimes due to a flash of insight and sometimes the outcome of many tentatives. Newton's passage from a falling apple to a falling moon was a stupendous leap of the scientific imagination. The modern science of the atom 
is the outcome of the testing of many approximate formulations. The laws of nature are man's descriptive formulae of uniformities of sequence, which enable him to say, if this, then that. These laws are not all of the same rank. They differ in precision and comprehensiveness. The meaning of their terms often changes with time. Science is not only human, it is often anthropomorphic. It may even reflect the social outlook of the age. Thus, in biology, one of the less exact sciences, provisional concepts, such as the struggle for existence, are often borrowed from human affairs. And while illuminating suggestion often comes from this, there is no small risk of fallacy. Science is not so objective as is sometimes supposed. We can no more escape from anthropomorphism than from our own shadow. Yet those who exaggerate the subjectivity of science and declare with the great philosopher of today that scientific truth is the creation of the human mind and not of outer nature are missing what is characteristic of man's scientific formulation of the order of nature, that it must be verifiable by all normally constituted minds and that it must form a reliable basis for prediction, if not also for control. The fact that the astronomer can predict the night of the comet's return and the Mendelian the nature of the hybrid rabbit's litter shows that our formulations approximate towards objective reality. Scope of Science There is much to be said for using the word science with a qualifying adjective, such as chemical and physical science, natural science, biological science, mental and moral science, social science, abstract science. For the various sciences differ greatly in their degree of precision. When we pass from chemistry and physics to the study of living creatures and their behavior, to the study of human societies and their interrelations, we find that accurate measurements and precise registration are more difficult. Analysis is very imperfect, formulation is very provisional, test experiments are hard to devise, and prediction is usually hazardous. The discovery of methods, concepts, and formulae has advanced much further in regards to matter and energy than it has in dealing with the realm of organisms and the kingdom of man. An exact science is like a solar system. A young science is like a nebula. Yet the student of, say, dreams may be as scientific as the student of rocks, provided he never allows assertion to outstrip evidence and understands what he knows. Science includes all knowledge, communicable and verifiable, which is reached by methodical observation and experiment, and admits of concise, consistent, and connected formulation. But all science is not the same science. A saving clause of some importance relates to the use of scientific symbols. The modern physicist assures us of the reality of the atom, but until a few years ago, the atom was only a symbol a working hypothesis approximating to reality. Many terms in common scientific usage remain in the symbolic stage. A chromosome is a visible something, but no one has seen a gene or factor. Yet these genes are dealt with in modern theories of heredity as if they were seeds in a pod. They are indispensable. No one supposes that a carbon atom has four hands, but this symbol has been extraordinarily useful. Fanciful or arbitrary symbols never live long. They are retained only when they afford a convenient basis for prediction and control. The history of science shows in an eloquent way how provisional symbols are tested and how some of them gradually attain to the dignity of realities as the atom has done. Classification of the Sciences There are three great orders of facts, the domain of things, the realm of organisms, and the kingdom of man. Thus, some have spoken of the cosmosphere, the biosphere, and the sociosphere. The fundamental sciences of chemistry and physics deal with matter and energy, especially in the physical universe. Biology has the life of organisms for its province. The young, and yet in a sense very old science of sociology, deals with human societies and folkways. Physics and chemistry are practically inseparable. Biology and psychology often look like different aspects of the same elusive activity which we call life. Sociology deals with groups of men where the whole is more than the sum of its parts. But there is much to be said for the recognition of five fundamental sciences 
which may be arranged on this scheme. Sociology, psychology, biology, physics, chemistry. It will be seen that biology occupies a central position resting in part on physics and chemistry, though with independent methods and concepts of its own, and supplying in turn a basis to psychology and sociology. Each main or general science has its subdivisions. Thus, biology includes botany and zoology. A great part of astronomy must be ranked under physics, and much of mineralogy under chemistry. Then there are the combined sciences, like geology and geography and anthropology, which use the methods and concepts of several sciences for their own particular purposes. Thus, geography is like circle intersecting four or five others for a particular end. Furthermore, there are applied sciences, where departments of general science are focused for practical purposes on particular sets of problems, such as those connected with the arts and crafts. Thus, agricultural science and medical science, the science of engineering, and the young science of education are, in great part, applied sciences, and are neither more nor less scientific on that account. As Huxley always insisted, applied science is nothing but the application of pure science to detailed practical problems. But on a different line are the abstract sciences, which deal with necessary relations between abstract ideas or propositions, irrespective of the actual content. They are deductive rather than inductive, ideal, not experimental, dealing with methods, not with observations. They comprise mathematics in particular, also statistical methods, graphic methods, and logic. Some would include here that part of metaphysics, which has for its business the criticism of categories, or a study of explanations as such. So we reach an outline map of scientific knowledge. Abstract Sciences metaphysics, logic, statistical and graphic methods, mathematics, general sciences, sociology, psychology, biology, physics, chemistry, some special sciences, ethnology, aesthetics, zoology, botany, astronomy, meteorology, mineralogy, some combined sciences, science of history, anthropology, history of the biosphere, geology and geography, history of the solar system, some applied sciences, economics, education, medicine, engineering, metallurgy, agriculture. In considering such a map of the sciences, it should be kept in mind that they differ not merely in their subject matter, but in their aims and methods. The same subject may be tackled by several sciences. There is a chemistry and a physics of the human body, as well as a biology thereof. The chick may be studied anatomically, physiologically, embryologically, psychologically, and even then we have not exhausted the totality of the chick. The sciences are parts of one endeavor to understand the order of nature and human life within it. They form a correlated body of knowledge, they work into each other's hands, and succeed best when they recognize mutual rights and limitations. The chemistry and physics of the beanstalk are indispensable, but when they are added up, they do not give us the biology of the beanstalk, still less of Jack. It is begging many questions to insist that there is only one science of nature, which describes all things and changes in terms of ideal motions, expressible in mathematical formulae. This is trying to give a false simplicity to the facts. Even the omniscient chemist cannot tell how the cat will jump. Professor Dolbear writes, By explanation is meant the presentation of the mechanical antecedents for a phenomenon in so complete a way that no supplementary or unknown factors are necessary. But many biologists of today would agree that in dealing with distinctively vital behavior, such as the cat's jump, it is necessary to invoke other than mechanical factors such as the organism's power of enregistering and profiting by experience. There is a correlation rather than a unity of the sciences. Limitations of Science No one will be inclined to set limits to man's understanding, but it is useful to recognize that science as we know it is the subject to certain limitations. 1. 
there is a self-imposed limitation in the fact that science applies its methods to abstracted aspects of things. We cannot intellectually separate a living creature from its surroundings any more than we can separate a whirlpool from the river. Yet for biological purposes, we continually think the fish away from the sea and the bird from the air. In analytical anatomy, it is actually profitable to do so. Even in more exact sciences, this limitation operates. In dynamics, we treat the mass of a body as if we studied the body under the influence of gravitation only. But in actual observations and experiments, we can never secure the entire absence of electrical, magnetic, and other energies. In other words, science works with ideal systems. It aims at practically convenient representations of certain aspects of facts deliberately abstracted from other aspects. 2. Science works with counters, or concepts which are in various degrees far from being self-explanatory. What mysteries lie behind the terms organism, protoplasm, heredity, energy, chemical affinity, gravitation, inertia, matter. It is admitted that the analysis of concepts proceeds apace and that the number of irreducibles grows less, but there are many X's left. 3. Another limitation has to do with causal sequence. One billiard ball strikes another, an impelling cause, a spark explodes the gunpowder, a releasing cause. The relaxed spring turns the cylinder of the gramophone and there is music. But it is only in the first case that the cause explains the effect. In the other cases, the effect is more or less given in advance. In the great majority of cases, all that science does is to say, if this, then that. Its causal explanations are usually very partial. 4. Another limitation concerns origins, which remain mysteries. The biologist begins with the first organisms, but whence came they? The chemist begins with the elements, but what has been their history? There is always something before the beginning with which the scientific investigator starts and must start. So there are limitations implied in the partial view we have to take in prosecuting a scientific inquiry, in the radical mysteriousness of the counters we use, in the difficulty of giving complete causal explanations, except in the field of mechanics, and likewise in the obscurity of origins. If these necessary limitations were more clearly kept in mind, the aim and scope of science would be less frequently misunderstood. Moreover, besides all these limitations, there are others of a different kind, imposed on us by the limits of our sense organs, even when greatly helped by ingenious instruments and by narrow limits of exact data in regard to the past. Furthermore, it should be kept in mind that formulae or laws, which seemed for a time to fit well, have often had to undergo readjustment with the increase of knowledge and the recognition of residual phenomena. So Kepler improves on Copernicus, and Newton on Kepler, and Einstein, some say, on Newton. Science may be compared to an asymptotic line, which is always approaching nearer and nearer to some curve, but never reaching it except at infinite distance. Sometimes, a single discovery may change the whole framework of a science. Thus, Professor Soddy, speaking of radioactivity, says, It sounds incredible, but nevertheless it is true, that science up to the close of the 19th century had no suspicion even of the existence of the original sources of natural energy. The vista, which has been opened up by these new discoveries of the radioactive properties of some substances, admittedly is without parallel in the whole history of science. And sometimes it is with a new idea, like that of organic evolution, which changes the whole outlook of a science and makes the world new. Finally, according to well-warranted scientific belief, there was once a time when all that happened upon the earth might have been formulated with apparent exhaustiveness in terms of matter and motion. But ages passed and living creatures emerged, a new synthesis requiring new formulae. Ages passed and intelligent creatures commanded their course. A new aspect of reality required a new science. Ages passed and man emerged, with self-consciousness, language, reasoning capacity, and a social heritage. As the world grew older, the biosphere emerged from the cosmosphere, 
and out of the biosphere there emerged the sociosphere. As long as its subject matter continues evolving in the direction of new integrations, science must also evolve. Science and Feeling Our life is like a prism. Its three sides are 1. Doing, 2. Feeling, and 3. Knowing, corresponding to the old-fashioned hand, heart, and head. Each is a doorway out, 1. To the world of action, 2. To the world of art, music, religious ritual, literature, and 3. To the world of externally registered thinking, from a stone circle to a nautical almanac, from a map to a census, from a calendar to a chemical balance. Men are happily of diverse moods. 1. Some have a practical turn of mind, with a pathological extreme in matter-of-factness and materialism, but are essentially men of action who must make things hum and get things done. 2. Some are men of feeling, going out by the emotional doorway with a pathological extreme in sentimentalism, but essentially men of artistic insight, and sometimes, as poets and seers, the makers and shakers of this world of ours. 3. Some are predominantly men of intellect, who elect to know, not do, who discover causes, uniformities, laws, and who try to think things out. The pathological extreme botanizes on his mother's grave, as Wordsworth put it, and jibs at proud philosophy, but there is no doubt that the makers of new knowledge have transformed human life, giving it a new freedom and fullness. Every intellectual combatant seeks more or less resolutely to gain an all-around or synoptic view of his experience, and this is his philosophy. Our present point is that this must be, for most men, in a large degree, a matter of temperament, according as the practical, the emotional, or the scientific mood is dominant. To return to the old-fashioned hand, heart, and head, these are not only doorways out, they are portals in. For life is like a dome, always with its concave and convex side, subjective as well as objective. Thus, there is the inner world of appendices and urges, desires and ideals, which lead externally to action, the world of feelings and emotions which lead to art, and the world of intellectual experimentation which has its external expression in, let us say, the archives of science. All these are natural and necessary expressions of the developing human spirit, and it is in the deepest sense unphilosophical to pit one against the other, or to make antitheses between the different glimpses of reality which are to be obtained from each of three great doorways of our being. Truly, science as science is unemotional and impersonal, and its analytic, atomizing, or anatomizing methods are apt, in their matter-of-factness, to seem antagonistic to artistic unities and poetical interpretations. But here must be learned the lesson of patience and open-mindedness, and here the limitations of science must be borne in mind. The poetry of the man of feeling must not contradict the formulations of the man of science, but they are speaking different languages, and we may know by feeling some aspect of reality which eludes us in scientific analysis. Our delight in fine scenery is not less real than our knowledge of the geology. Both are pathways to reality. When science makes minor mysteries disappear, greater mysteries stand confessed. For one object of delight, whose emotional value science has inevitably lessened, as Newton damaged the rainbow for Keats, science gives back double. To the grand primary impressions of the world power, the immensities, the pervading order, and the universal flux, with which the man of feeling has been nurtured from of old, modern science has added thrilling impressions of manifoldness, intricacy, uniformity, interrelatedness, and evolution. Science widens and clears the emotional window. There are great vistas to which science alone can lead, and they make for elevation of mind. The opposition between science and feeling is largely a misunderstanding. As one of our philosophers has remarked, science is in a true sense one of the humanities. Science and Religion Science seeks to discover 
the laws of concrete being and becoming and to state these in the simplest possible terms. These terms are either the immediate data of experience or verifiably derived from these. Religion, on the other hand, implies a recognition, practical, emotional, and intellectual, of a higher order of reality than is reached in sense experience. It sees an unseen universe which throws light on the riddles of the observed world. Its language is not scientific language, and the two cannot be spoken at once. The concepts of religion are transcendental, those of science are empirical. The aim of religion is interpretation, not description. Religious interpretation and scientific description must not be inconsistent, but they are incommensurable. This is not falling back on the impossible solution of having idea-tight compartments. What is meant is that while the form of religious idea, of creation, let us say, must be congruent with the established scientific system, scientific description and religious interpretation work in two quite different universes of discourse. Science and Philosophy The philosophical outlook is synoptic, an all-around view. In other words, a philosophical system is the outcome of interpretive reflection on the whole data of our experience. Science and philosophy are complementary. To the scientific thinker, philosophy is of service in helping him to recognize the limitations of his task and the assumptions with which he starts. It may save him from being easygoing in the criticism of his categories. On the other side, a modern philosophy must take account of all the far-reaching results of scientific inquiry. Thus, an adequate interpretive system must have been receptive to all the influences of such conclusions as the principle of the conservation of energy, the doctrine of organic evolution, and the outstanding facts of heredity. Philosophy has, of course, no right to call the tune which it wishes science to play, but its task is to correlate the conclusions of science with those which may be reached in the course of practical, ethical, aesthetic, or religious experience. Philosophy begins where the experimental and observational sciences leave off, but it does not follow that philosophy in its edifice must use the building stones just as science hands them over. It is here that philosophical criticism and all-aroundedness must come in. Thus, the results of the modern study of heredity need not be accepted in a form so crude that the inevitable outcome is fatalism. The results of modern biochemistry need not be accepted in a form so partial that they confine us to a mechanistic view of the living creature. The results of the modern study of animal behavior need not be accepted in a form so one-sided that it practically rules mind out of court. These are merely examples of the opportunities which philosophy has for a criticism of scientific categories, a task for which the majority of scientific investigators is poorly equipped. To take another illustration, the principle of the conservation of energy, formulated in reference to the transformations that go on in physical experiments, must not be allowed to foreclose discussion of the question whether mind and body, if these be recognized as admissible scientific or philosophical terms, can interact in a way that really counts. And the answer given to that question, or to some similar question more satisfactorily phrased, affects the general philosophical or metaphysical theory that one holds in regard to the world as a whole and man in particular. Similarly, when philosophy takes over from the biologist the formula of organic evolution that the present is the child of the past and the parent of the future, it is bound to scrutinize the concept of evolution and to show that it is no easy one, and it is bound to make very clear the difference between accepting the modal formula, indicative of the general mode by which the present biosphere has come about, and accepting any particular statement of the factors in the age log process. The general fact of evolution stands firmer than ever, but inquiry into the factors is still relatively young. Science and Life The primary purpose of science is understanding, but knowledge is power. As Bacon said, the end of our foundation, Solomon's house, is the knowledge of causes and the secret motions of things, and the enlarging of the bounds of human empire 
to the effecting of all things possible. The two aspects are hardly separable. All the sciences, including mathematics, sprang from concrete experience of practical problems, and the most theoretical investigations have made the biggest differences in man's everyday life today. Wireless telegraphy, the telephone, aeroplanes, radium, antiseptics, antitoxins, spectrum analysis, and x-rays were all discovered in the course of abstractly scientific researches. If the utilitarian criterion is pressed in a short-sighted way, then, as to results, it defeats itself. And apart from this consideration, itself utilitarian, it is profitable to return to Bacon's distinction between those results of science which are of direct practical utility, fructifera, and those which are light-giving, lucifera, a distinction which led to the admirable deliverance. Just as the vision of light itself is something more excellent and beautiful than its manifold use, so without doubt the contemplation of things as they are, without superstition or imposture, without error or confusion, is in itself a nobler thing than a whole harvest of inventions. The old discouragement expressed in the saying that increase of knowledge is increase of sorrow has been replaced by a more robust confidence in what science may achieve in the control of life. The modern outlook is expressed in Herbert Spencer's pithy sentence, Science is for life, not life for science. Or in Comte's well-known saying, Knowledge is foresight, and foresight is power. Bacon had the idea clearly in mind when he wrote in the advancement of learning, this is that which will indeed dignify and exalt knowledge if contemplation and action be more nearly and straightly conjoined and united together than they have been. And the passage ends by declaring that what is sought in science should be a rich storehouse for the glory of the Creator and the relief of man's estate. But what is distinctively modern is the ideal of bringing the light of science to bear on man's problems all along the line, on health of mind as well as of body, on education as well as on agriculture, on ethical development as well as on the more economical exploitation and usage of natural resources, on eugenics as well as on utopias. Just as many ills that the flesh is heir to are met no longer with folded hands, but by confident therapeutics, so over a wide range there is a promiseful application of all kinds of science to the amelioration of the conditions of human life. Great stories of wealth are awaiting the scientific open sesame. A great heightening of the standard of health will be attainable in a few generations if men of good will take science as their torch. But wealth and health are the preconditions of true progress, which means a fuller embodiment of the true, the beautiful, and the good in lives which are increasingly a satisfaction in themselves. End of section 23. Recording by Chad Jackson. End of the Outline of Science, Volume 4, by J. Arthur Thompson.